Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this moment to say thank you for listening to the Real Rescue Podcast. It means a lot to me that you enjoy these stories as much as I do. Since the start of this podcast, we've had a lot of support from all over the world. It has been amazing. Now, we have companies joining our team that also want to say thank you for all that you are doing out there standing the watch. These companies are offering discounts on their products as a way to support the rescue community and those tuning into the Real Rescue Podcast. Just go to therealrescue.com, click on sponsors, and see these incredible offers for yourself. This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Axness, because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And Airwave, the Airwave Performance Mouthpiece, helping you to use breathing to your advantage. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. The Axness PNG wireless ICS system can bring cutting edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere, at any time, on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircrafts worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axness.com. That's A-X-N-E-S dot com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, long line, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Plus, they are offering another 10% from their partners, Petzl and their equipment, all you gotta do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com, mention this podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. And airway. What if I told you that you could train harder for longer and recover faster just by wearing a mouthpiece? I know, I questioned it too. Then I gave it a try. The Airwave Performance Mouthpiece is a breakthrough in performance technology that is scientifically proven with over 15 years of peer-reviewed published research at the Citadel to open your airway by 25% for improved breathing, resulting in a 20% decrease in respiratory rate, an increase in muscular endurance, and 50% reduction in cortisol levels post-workout. Now, what does this mean to me? Well, now I'm able to train harder, recover faster, and be even more prepared for when that SAR alarm goes off. You don't need to take my word for it. Try it yourself 
and see how you can use your breathing to your advantage. Go to airwave.com or visit them on Instagram at airwave to learn more about it. Then, when you're ready to give it a try, because you heard about it here at The Real Rescue, you get 10% off with the promotion code Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Coming up next, we've got more amazing stories from Ireland. The Irish Coast Guard is at it again. And man, oh, I, I get so pumped when I get some of these stories and the ones that you know you see online and through social media. And now all of a sudden, the reality right here on the podcast, I get to hear like the in depth of what actually happened on scene. I get so pumped on it. So please welcome my next guest. He is a winch operator and a winchman, Mr. Nick O'Hara. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Oh, man, I'm pumped today. We've got another brother of ours coming from Ireland. And uh, the great part about that for me is I, I love what you guys are doing in Ireland. I love the stories that I've already heard. Uh, just hanging out with you guys is still to come. <laughs> but I know it's going to be a good time. So today we've got Adrian O'Hara. O'Hara, right? Yep, okay. O'Hara, that's it. Perfect. Okay, just making sure. We go, uh, we're going to call him Nick because that's what all his friends are. And I made the Christmas list as of today. So now I'm a friend. Booyah! <laughs> Nick, <laughs> welcome to the Real Rescue, man. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you for having me on, on the program. So thank you so much. Uh, oh, absolutely. Heck yeah. So a little really? background about you is uh, so you're a winch operator currently. And you were a winchman, so you were a guy on the hook. You were a full-on paramedic, which is awesome. Uh, part rescue swimmer, is that part of the winchman duty with you guys? Um, Getting in the water? I, I suppose yes and no. We, we don't use the title rescue swimmer, but yeah, like the winchman role, he would end up, he or she would end up in the water from time to time. So yeah, we do maybe have to swim into a, a casualty and stuff like that. So yeah, from, I suppose, a practical point of view, we do swim at times but we we just call ourselves uh winchmen or winch operators we don't use the term rescue swimmer but that that captures us also i like that Perfect. that's why i call myself a rescue specialist <laughs> hey i like it hey <laughs> all right so currently working with chc helicopters with the irish coast guard as a winchman uh but Outside of that, if you don't mind, give everybody a little background history about you. How did you get into search and rescue and Irish Coast Guard, winch operator, winch men, and everything you've done? Indeed. So uh, how I actually got into search and rescue wasn't necessarily a, a lifelong dream or anything like that. You know, from a, a childhood age, it was actually by accident. And I mean by complete accident. And if truth be known, it was actually to, to dodge another line of work completely. So my own history is that I joined the Irish Defence Forces in 1994. Uh, and as part of that, then when you're in the Irish Defence Forces, there's lots of things that you do. I did uh, two trips overseas uh, with the United Nations in Lebanon and stuff like that. We did other various bits and pieces in the country as well. But one of the things that we used to have to do in the Army is you have all these inspections, big inspections, big officer inspections. Uh, and a major inspection that you would have every year was called a, a GOC's inspection, which was the General Officer Commanding. So you literally spent weeks polishing, shining, painting, just, uh, it was just all the stuff I didn't like, Jason. I just, no, there has to be a way out of this. So heading back into the dormitory, we stay, <clears throat> excuse me, we stay in dormitories at the time. And heading back into the dormitory, on the notice board inside, I noticed that there was a little A4 page with like almost like a cartoon, a hand-drawn picture on it. And they were recruiting for search and rescue people up in Baldonnan in Casement Aerodrome, which is our base where we keep our, our Irish Air Corps, or Air Wing, if you like. Okay. Uh, and they were looking for winch operators, winch men, or, or rescue swimmers. So that all sounded very interesting. But what I did notice on the very bottom of the page is that the interviews and the selection coincided with the date of the GOC's inspection. 
<laughs> so, in, in my head, at the time, God's honest truth, at the time, I didn't even realise that we had a search and rescue capability in Ireland ourselves, within our own Irish Defence Forces back in 1994. But that didn't matter to me, because I saw that the date for the interview and the selection was on the same date as the GOC's command, the inspection. So I reckoned, if I went for the selection and the interview, I would get out of the inspection. And I was right. I was absolutely 100% right. Well so, played. So I applied for the, the selection and then I was excused all the, the duties of polishing because then I had to go in and train for it. So quits in. Hey, winner, so, winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So <laughs> I, I went up, I did the interview and here I am now. 20 odd years later, talking to Jason Quinn about my search and rescue career. Oh <laughs> so, my gosh, I love and it. And that's how I ended up in search and rescue by pure accident and just to dodge work. That, so, uh, so wait, dodging work to do more in, an, in another job. I mean, <laughs> little did I know that if I had just done that little bit of work back in the inspection, I would have saved myself 24 years of incredible work. <laughs> so, but I wasn't to know that at the time. So, oh my um, gosh. That was in, in 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 1998. I joined the the Irish Air Corps, as I say, and uh, I started off then on Alouettes, uh, a single engine aircraft, very small Alouette three. And so a lot of people, I you know what, I actually had to look this up. So for everybody out there, look up the Alouette three. It's a very interesting looking aircraft. Uh, French make it from off the top of my head. It's a French yes, aircraft. As far as, yeah, it's Alouette, and, general French. Yeah. And it, uh, mm. it, it's a very small, it's a smaller cabin. Very, very yeah. small, very small aircraft, very powerful aircraft, very, uh, very good in the mountains. And I, I, I think I could be wrong. It's only up until recently that it was stopped being used still in, in some of the French mountains because it was oh, just wow. so, yeah, it was just so, um, it was just so good for mountain flying. Like, and also it was incredibly power, powerful aircraft. So I started off with that, and I think we had a, 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 a pneumatic hoist or something. I remember it was a very basic hoist, and I remember those huge big pipes and stuff coming through up over the door. So, But the aircraft itself was tiny. If You couldn't stand up inside in it, and even on your knees, when you, when you kind of straightened yourself up, your head came very close to the roof. Yeah. And if you just outstretched your hands completely, you nearly touched your port and starboard windows. And certainly, if you rotated 90 degrees, you would have smacked the, the, the pilot on the side of the head. So that's <laughs> that's kind of the area that you were operating in there. Yeah. So qualified tight. in that. Very tight. Very tight, very tight, uh, but very memorable. So qualified on that. Uh, and then I think maybe a year or two or three years after that, qualified on the Dauphin, which was a, a twin-engined, uh, and again, a, a French aircraft, I think. Yeah, uh, and and that's was, what the U.S. Coast Guard uses, or one of them. Yeah, and, and do you call it a dolphin, Jason, or do you, dolphin, do you call it yeah. a dolphin? Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, the, uh, two names, usually the H-65 um, or the dolphin. Okay, Either perfect. One. So. Either one. So uh, then qualified on that and remained in the accord until 2001 and then transferred across into the Irish Coast Guard or to CHC Ireland, uh, who is my employer. But we were on contract to the Irish Coast Guard and still are. So remained in the Dublin base then for, I think, maybe about a year. And then in November 2002, and on the Dublin base, I was working on uh, Rescue 116, which at the time was the S61, the Sikorsky 61N, I think, was the official title of it or the official model number. And then transferred down to Waterford, down to Rescue 117 in 2002. Remained there ever since. Uh, and I'm still working down there now on the S92. So that's beautiful. A, a very short version of my career. <laughs> that's great. That's perfect. Yeah. And in that time, you have done quite a bit. So, you know, like it's the first question I'm going to ask is, do you remember your very first rescue? I, my, my very first rescue, I'm not too sure, but the, my very first memorable rescue, I suppose, is that uh, I was up. We used to have a base at the time, so it goes back to maybe around 90, 98, I think. It was certainly on the Dauphin, and we were based up in the, the northern half of Ireland, up in Donegal, in a place called Finner Camp. 
Um, so the the army has a, a has a base up there, a camp up there, and there was um, the Air Corps had an attachment to it. So and we used to do search and rescue duties out of there. So it was two fishermen, and uh, it was he went out fishing during the morning, lots of rain all day, and the river had just rose around him. Not to a massive extent, but just enough that he couldn't get off the rock that he was on right in the middle of the river to get back to the bank. So I always remember because I remember looking out the door and the, the winch operator at the time was a man called Paddy Mooney, God rest him, who lost his life uh, tragically in uh, Tremor Sand Dunes in 1999 when Rescue 111 crashed in the Tremor Sand Dunes down there. So he was one of the uh, members of, of the crew for that. Bummer. So, bummer, yeah, big, big bummer. So the... I remember looking out the door and looking down and it was actually very hard to spot the fishermen because the the, the trees of the or the branches of the trees were just slightly obscuring them. But I, I do remember seeing the white Russian water, you know, just the, the torrent of water all around them and the whole lot. And every now and again, with the wind and the downdraft from the aircraft, the, the, the branches were kind of apart and, and you'd see the fishermen down below. So somehow they had uh, managed to, to get ropes from the bank to tie onto the fishermen so they, they had tied them from either side so if you can imagine a rope was passed from his left hand side and i suppose fair play to him he said all right i better tie that onto myself so he, he would tie it onto himself and then another rope was passed from the right hand side and then sure right i better tie that onto myself too so now i'm absolutely secure but the thing is is that if he did go into the water he, he would have just been pulled from either bank but not necessarily no, going it- he just would have been kept in the middle of the river, but just been pulled really forcibly from either bank. So it would have been like a massive tug of war. Just that would have been using... terrible. Unbelievable. Like when I look back <laughs> at it now, I said, that was such a shockingly bad idea. But like at the time, it made total sense, you know? So you're looking down at the river. I think we were up at, I don't know, we were up at a nice height. I remember saying to myself, oh, I don't think I ever winched out this height before at all. Like, but we, we were still obviously <laughs> in the range of the cable. So... Paddy Mooney, just cool as cucumber, absolutely no problem at all. Check your gear, everything all right. Yeah, so off out the door I went. Uh, eventually got down to the fishermen. So there wasn't necessarily enough room for the two of us to be on the rock. So like it just showed the skill of the, and I think that's what remained with me as, as the memory from the time was the skill that I was just hanging there. But I wasn't necessarily on anything but like my feet were just barely touching the rock that was just either side of the fisherman but I was just hanging there and I was just so so still I won't say so calm because it was one of my first rescues like like my my head was in a fucking heap like drawing just going like oh what's going on <laughs> so and you can you can hear the water you can hear the water just thundering either side of you like drawing you know, when you're right alongside it and that remained with me. It's just the noise of the water and and the smell of fresh river water, you know, fresh rainwater. That it's, yeah. it's a very cool, and you can smell it like, and it's like, oh, and then the noise, and and then you're you're faced in front of this man, and, and there's a rope going off either side of him to the to the bank. So I I put the strap on him, and uh, and I tightened Ooh. the strap, and I said, right, that's brilliant. No, no, we can lift him. I said, hold on a second. It's actually fucking tied to the bank. I can't. I can't just fucking lift them. If I lift them, I'm either going to pull people into the river or like, oh, and this is all going through my mind. So I looked up at, at Paddy and I didn't. I can't remember if I give my thumbs up or not. So I didn't. I don't know where. I just got it out of someplace and I just cut the rope either side. So I said, right, that's grand. I can lift them up now. So up uh, we came, but we didn't. Even though I was giving him the hand signals to go up into the aircraft, he, he didn't. He didn't bring us up into the aircraft. So instead, then we just kind of cut through some trees. So I was kind of saying, like, where, where are we going? Maybe there's a problem, whatever the case is. But it was just into the field next door and just landed us onto the field. They landed on next to us. And then we back, we went, obviously, back into the aircraft, back off to the camp. Uh, and obviously, the fisherman was delighted then. Probably, I'd say, he was a little bit sore a couple of days after because, like, there was... There was quite a bit of tension on those ropes when I went down to them. So I because people didn't want to lose them off the rock. So I imagine they were pulling from the right hand side. People <laughs> over the other side are saying, we don't want to lose them off the rock. So we better pull them and try to have a nice bit of tension on them as well. So I can just imagine the forces that were on them. So uh and that was my first rescue as as I remember it. That's my first memory of my rescue anyway. Like you know, but I just, I just remember at the time it was just a bit of a roller coaster because the height. The water but then it was it was the calmness of just sitting there 
and and literally just like we are that is so awesome yeah and you're, you're just sitting there looking at this man but you're not moving up and down you're not being trashed left and right you're, you're just sitting there and that's is that calmness that serenity if you want to call it that while all the all the water is rushing around you didn't know that you know so it was fantastic yeah so that's that's the first memorable one. Oh, that is awesome that is <laughs> fantastic with a, with a short haul out too so you got picked up you, hanging below the aircraft just roll over to a field set down yeah and, and that was it and it, it, it was the simplicity of it like i suppose like uh, when i think about dinner it was the and sometimes like you know some i think sometimes we overcomplicate things because like you know they, they can be like uh, we're when you're talking about coming back up a height into the aircraft it's the safety of the winchman safety of the casualty you know and bringing them back in the door and so on and so forth like so but it's just so simple we'll just keep them at a safe height over the ground just put them into the field there you go job done so obviously you still have to recover the cable and all that kind of stuff but you know your your primary task is done the fisherman is off the rock he's in the field he's nice and safe yeah it's so done, simple huh? so <laughs> simple yeah so as i said just just keep it simple <laughs> what a great first like memorable rescue that's yeah. i like that a lot Man. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. It was good. It was good. It was brilliant. The description you give too, like that that the rainwater smell that you have just after a good fresh rain, the ripping river. Oh yeah. yeah. And, I can and picture I think, all uh, of it. Yeah, and I, and I think the colors of it, like it, there's some rivers obviously here in Ireland where they're where they're kind of born or they're originating kind of bog. So they've this very kind of dark, not muddy, but almost like a just like um it's hard to describe it. Uh, just almost like a Coca-Cola look to it. Do you know that color, that kind of darkish yeah. color? Yep. But it's not a muddy color. Um, so even though there was heavy rain, it, the river had just risen, but it ha didn't have that really muddy brown color to it. Um, but it just, I always remember that. And and just, yeah, just the visuals and the noise. The, I'll never forget that noise, because you could hear it over the helicopter and everything else. Just that thundering noise of, of the water rushing either side of you. But you're, you're just sitting there in this canvas. And you're just like there. That and is so awesome. Yeah, it was just nuts. <laughs> just nuts. That's why it kind of stays with me, you know. Just yeah, it was a mix of emotions. Like it was good. Man, that is that is great. I love it. Love it. <laughs> yes, yes. Gosh, it was good. All right. Yes. Well, now we're gonna get into a couple other ones that you have. Um, so one of them is in 2014, and. You had sent me a, a couple of things and I, I love to, this is why I love reading this stuff. Um, so in 2014, there was an article written and this was, uh, you know what? I'm going to let you explain the whole thing, but this is where it started. So the Irish Examiner, this is irishexaminer.com. Uh, they did a little article in November 21st of 2014. Title of the article, Fishermen Killed When Hauling Equipment Broke. Uh, let's see. It's the casualty from Castle Gregory County, uh, Co. Kerry Gregory. County? Yeah. Oh, County. Okay. Yeah. So the shop County. Board, County. Yeah. Yeah. County Kerry. yeah. Kerry County. Perfect. Uh, had been on board the fishing vessel Liberty on February 14, 2013. 37 nautical miles south of Old Head of uh, Kinsel? Kinsel? Kinsale. Cork Kinsale. County. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when the accident happened. Um, so the, uh, let's see, uh, it's going on a little further. The report of the uh, Marine Casualty Investigation released yesterday the rope failed during a hauling of equipment, caused a split link to strike Mr. Mr. Wilds. So that, this whole thing, uh, it, it goes down further because I want to touch on what you guys, during the helicopter rescue operation, an emergency hoisting system was successfully deployed after both the winchman and the stretcher were pulled off the desk and then went into the sea. All right. So I know what I've read and there's there's a lot of stuff that that happened with this that they really didn't touch on and, and i know you and i touched on a little bit prior to talking here so give us a rundown a little bit of what was the call out let's start with that so the call out was uh, not unique but i suppose maybe a little bit strange insofar as that uh, as the newspaper article said 
there was a, a fisherman injured on board a boat. And at the time, we didn't know how seriously that they were injured, only that there was a fisherman injured on board a boat. I think there was only two or three people on board a boat. It was quite a small trawler. I can't even remember what type it was. Um, but it was like a, a fishing trawler, not necessarily just collecting lobster pots or anything like that. So the aircraft that was originally tasked was from uh, another base. So we got the call after. So the other base responded to the call and they deployed our winchman. And the winchman, once he got on the deck, then assessed us and made the call immediately that actually the person is, is deceased. They had injuries that were incompatible with life. And it was obvious. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it was, it was yeah, obvious exactly. when, he, when he got on the deck. Yeah, it, it was really kind of sad story, kind of tragic. But when the skipper um, made the call, he was obviously looking from, I think, Murray was looking obviously he was up in the wheelhouse when he made the call uh the sea state was quite rough uh I think it was I think it was six to eight meter seas or something it was it was quite six big six to eight meter seas holy yeah shit. it was it was quite big it was a, it was a stormy night uh and I didn't want to start the whole tale but it was a dark and stormy night but it was <laughs> but, it, but it was a dark and stormy night you know, uh, sometimes you just gotta start with that. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, yeah, I just feel it's not the. It was a dark and stormy night, but I just didn't want to do that. With so. the Irish accent, it makes it even better. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> I don't mean, it was a dark and stormy night. So, oh, I'm so excited. It was just uh, so, and um, so the the winchman had been deployed by another aircraft. He made the assessment right. Obviously, the, the man is deceased. So. But when the call went in originally, they didn't know he was deceased because uh, he, he was on the, the deck of the boat. So I suppose there was a visual thing, whatever the case was. So uh, it took quite a bit of time for him to get the winchman onto the deck, uh, a considerable amount of time. So long, in fact, I think that they ended up leaving the winchman there and then going back into Cork Airport for fuel. So we then got the call to say, actually, look, there's a winchman being left on board a boat. And um, they're heading back in for fuel. Can you go back out, either to do top cover or whatever the case was? So when we pitched up then, we assessed the scene. And we were going to take the winchman off the back of the boat, which is fine. I offered, I think, the, to go down. And he said, no, 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 it's fine. Actually, it's grand. There's somebody here to tend the high line. He's deceased. There's only more we can do. We're going to recover him off the back of the boat. OK, perfect stuff. So... Um, between the jigs and the reels, then once we obviously got all our, our risk assessments and all that kind of stuff done, we went in to recover the winchman. So, as I said, it was quite a small boat. So, in for obviously for a lot of your listeners, they'll, they'll relate to this. Maybe for some listeners, they won't. So, certain vessels will act certain ways in, in, in different sea states. And some boats can handle big seas quite well. This particular boat, when it was met either with a large wave, to go up it or it hit it, it would, it would slow it down or, or stop it almost completely. And likewise, then when she went off the crest of a wave down into a trough, she would almost like get away from us. So like she would actually, if you like, ride the wave down into the trough. So there, there was quite a bit of movement there. Um, it was unique insofar as that the full complement of crew that was on our craft could remain on the aircraft. So I, find, I found myself kind of at a loss, if you like. So the winch operator is doing his bit up at the cargo door. The two pilots are obviously doing their bit up in the front. But as a winchman, I don't need to be deployed. So I'm, at the time, it was the S61, and I'm out the back bubble window, as we used to call it, on the starboard side. So I can actually see the whole thing. I can see the whole thing um, unfolding. So the hook is lowered down to the winchman. He connects up. And just as he connects up, the boat starts to come up onto a wave. And as he connects up, then the boat goes out over the wave and no heads away from us. But he, he's still on the boat because we weren't necessarily in the overhead at that stage. So we would wait until we're quite close. Then we in, take in the slack and gently lift them off the back. But we were just, just a little bit further back. So as the boat went away, it actually increased the distance between the winchman and the boat. So with that, his feet are off the deck. He's committed, so he's he's off the boat you now at this stage. So with the, the litter attached to him, right? With the litter, yeah, the stretcher. You, you call it litter, we call it a stretcher. So yeah, so with the oh, stretcher yeah, yeah. attached, and and with the person inside in it, 
uh, the winchman had brought down first uh, medical equipment and stuff like that. So the medical equipment then was at the base of the stretcher uh, in between the person's legs. Yeah. So the, it was a nice wow. bit of, of, of kit on it. So <clears throat> off the deck and swings back. So it, it, it literally just becomes like a pendulum. So and starts to, to swing back. So swings back past the, the winch operator. Winch operator is looking down, swings back. And then goes back by the air stair door. So if, if any of your listeners are, are familiar with the S61, the air stair door is, is quite a bit back. Uh, so he swings back just down by the air stair door and then swings forward in again. So as I said, like for some of your listeners will be quite familiar with it. So a pilot always wants to maintain reference with a boat, especially at night time. There is no other references. It, it's a dark night. So to maintain the visual references with the boat, you try and maintain station alongside the boat. So there's obviously movement between the aircraft adjusting and, and getting into position and maintaining those references. But this kind of exacerbates the swing. So the swing now is only going to get more violent because the, the high line has become ineffective at this stage. Um, the swing now becomes quite violent where the winchman swings forward again and comes back. So to the point, it gets to the extremes where the winchman has gone so far forward that it's, it's said inside the aircraft, Jesus, is, is that his boots? Is that, is that the stretcher? So he, he, swung foot, he swung so far forward that he now became visual with the pilot. And then he swung so far back that when I was sitting at the, the bubble window in the 61 and looking out, he was directly beneath me. So and I remember looking down and saying, Jesus, he's just beneath me. Like, and he, we estimated that he was about maybe, I don't know, 25, 30 feet above the water at that stage. So then there's just like, a, you can hear a noise, almost like a, I'm calling it a bang. And then he just, he disappears. He's gone. Holy shit. And just like that, there's like, for, the, for, the, for those initial seconds, there's just like silence inside the aircraft. He's gone. Bang. And it's like, then the winch up obviously kicks in. And it's like, cable is separated. Winchman is gone, trying to find him. And he automatically switches in into the backup hoist and all that. So he's doing all his bits. I'm looking out the bubble window and going, oh, he's gone. So then I have to go back over to the other side of the aircraft to, to radio, because at the time, that's where the radio base was, the radio sets. So I have to go back over. There is a lifeboat on the way out to us, and I just say to him, we just lost our life. Uh, we just lost our winchman into the water. Can you make best speed toward this location? So they absolutely gunned us and are absolutely busting through this massive sea to get to us. Um, so then, as all this is happening, I'm on the radio. I go back off to the seat and then I hear us call. I think I see his helmet. I think he sees his helmet. So you can just see a like a, a reflective strip across on yeah. top of the head. So I look down there and I see, oh, that's it. Yeah, there he is. So switch to the backup hoist, hook is lowered, aircraft is positioned back in overhead, hook is lowered down, uh, he connects it back onto the, the hook then again, and he's winched clean over the water. So we recovered him then back into the aircraft with the stretcher, with the casualty on board. So then it's a Holy case of... cow! Yeah, so how, how things can change, and I suppose the lesson that I learned from me, and I, I'll go on to more of them, is that how oh, you have to keep an open mind to stuff. So now you you bring the stretcher back on board. You put that in where it's supposed to be. No, you have your winchman back on board, but no, he's he's injured. He's potentially injured. We don't know. So we have to just go through the drills that he's injured. So I remember speaking to him and I said, look, we're going to put you into the spinal board just as a precaution because you, you've fallen quite a height. Uh, and as I say, we think maybe 25, 30 feet. So fell into with the a water. litter or with, with a, a litter, with a stretcher. And somebody Absolutely. in the stretcher. Absolutely. Holy so uh, recovered him back into the aircraft. So went back then into Cork Airport. And then the result of the cable swinging so much uh, on the 61, there was quite a few bits and pieces of equipment um, hanging on the right-hand side of the aircraft, the same side as the cable. And... The arrangement for the 61 is that the wheels were out on sponsons, kind of out on struts. So you had these metal bars, these metal struts extending out from the airframe. 
and on the leading edge of the metal frame, you had a lot of cabling, various bits and pieces for your landing gear. I think it was for the floats. There was floats attached onto the outside of the sponsons as well. So there was a lot of the cabling was in that. Uh, and when the, the hoist cable came back, it, it damaged some of that. So when we went into Cork Airport to land on, we couldn't get the landing gear down because now the, the cabling had been damaged to actually let the, the landing gear down. So we we're having difficulties with getting the landing gear down. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah, so like it was like, right, we'll go through the checklist again. And we go through the checklist again and we go through the checklist again because that's what the checklists are there for. So again, it, it kept on coming back there. I think you'll probably pick up on it that when you keep coming back to your drills, it actually gets you out of a lot of trouble. So you can end up in trouble for various reasons, but when you keep coming back to your drills, it gets you out of trouble. So we go through the checklist again. And I think it was on the, the third or fourth attempt that the landing gear came down. So with the, the 61, so we weren't too sure exactly at the time in the aircraft right then why we're having difficulty with the landing gear so with the 61 the kind of mechanism that was on it was like a it was like an elbow of an arm so that it lays used to extend out and lock and then if you can imagine then you can you can put in a pin into the elbow to lock it out straight to stop the gear from collapsing so we had to get out of the aircraft then i think i was winched out and then put this pin into the, the wheel. So the boys are in an extremely low hover and you, you put this pin into the wheel, into yeah. the landing. And that locks it out, that guarantees it then. So back onto the aircraft, eventually landed on onto, the, onto the, the runway or the ramp. And then just a very short, slow taxi up to where they, they asked us to park at a stand. I think it was outside the fire station or something like that. Uh, and eventually shot it down. And then I just remember then again, like that, it kind of goes back to the the other job that we did up in Donegal, where it was just the silence of of nothing. So that might that might seem like a strange thing to say, but there was nobody looking for checklists, there was nobody on radios, because like everything was the ante was really up. The Coast Guard were looking for updates. They were obviously on the ATC, checklists were being done, checking the winchmen. Do you know it was just constant talk, constant, constant, constant. Um, and then just kind of the uncertainty of why was the landing gear coming down, trying to go through various bits and pieces. So it was just when the engines eventually just stopped and it was just like silence. And I remember we were sitting inside the aircraft and <clears throat> we even just, we didn't open the cargo door for a couple of seconds. It was just a silence. It was just, it was brilliant. Because we knew once the cargo door was open, like it was going to be a, a fury of, of action again. You know, obviously the deceased person has to be looked after. Winchman has to be looked after all the other stuff that goes with it. So it was right. just that silence. I remember just taking it in. And then the cargo door opened and it was just carnage. We didn't realize the carnage we were working in until somebody came up to the aircraft and, and just looked and they were standing there, mouth open going, well, what's after happening? And we just explained to them like, John is just like, I'll, I'll go ahead and get a brush so and they just headed off and I think it was just they just didn't know what else to do I think it was just straight I'll, I'll just go ahead and get a brush so and, <laughs> and they were gone so more people came over then like you know and we eventually then got dealt with everything then and the whole lot and did all our, our debriefs then and stuff like that you know but it was just uh yeah it, it, it was a job that was unique um and huge lessons learned from it like you know that and I suppose when you go back to the start, is that um, it, was, it was a different type of aircraft that dropped off the winchman. It was more advanced, uh, it had more technology and stuff on board. So I suppose a more advanced aircraft had dropped off a winchman into a storm. And now, if you like, a, a lesser advanced technologically wise aircraft was going to pick them up. So it was always a, a lesson that I took with me leading on from that is that you know if a person is dropped off in certain conditions how have the conditions changed before you go to pick them back up and how is it going to affect your rescue and what are you right. going to do with it um and certainly to keep the open mind of you're going out uh to recover or to to rescue a casualty but you may end up looking after one of your own right which is the, which is exactly what i ended up doing like you know so it was that open-mindedness if you like and while we can't foresee or prepare for absolutely everything 
I think we do, in a realistic way, have to try and foresee something that might happen. What if, what if, and, and kind of constantly ask mm -hmm. ourselves the question, what if, in a realistic way, like I, I don't think you could, any of us could ever have dreamed up that scenario before it actually happened. But now that it has happened, it, it, it is something that kind of stays in the back of my mind. Um, and it was a, a, an incident then obviously that was looked into from our own internally and obviously outside then as well, because there was a fatality on the boat and so on and so forth. And lots of lessons were learned from that then as well. You know, it was huge amounts, huge things were learned from it. Uh, and certainly for me, uh, an awful lot of stuff was learned from it then as well, you know. Yeah. It, it probably explains for one or two of the grey hairs in the beard. <laughs> and I would imagine. And a couple on the head as well. Yeah, maybe so, one or two. <laughs> yeah, just one or two. So, um, but yeah, it was massive. So that that's that was just some of the things that I that I learned from that. It, that one always that was always stuck over my head. And I think because it was such such a big piece of equipment failure, because we always had you know such faith, we've such faith in our equipment, we've such faith in the engineers, and rightly so that look after our equipment. Like, and I think yeah. that's what allows us to do the job that we, we do, because we can we can hang our hat on the fact that it's absolutely been professionally looked after and cared for by absolutely professional engineers back at the base. And I think that's what allows us to go out at night time because you know the stuff works. We don't necessarily know what we're going to go out into. Right. But we can say that when we need it, it's going to work. Right. It may, work, it may kind of work differently to how we planned or the situation might be different to how we planned, but we can say that that piece of, que of equipment is the bit that we need for this particular job and we know that it's going to work. And I think that's what allows us to go out. That's what allows us to get onto the aircraft. I think I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think yourself, you know. But yeah, no, I, I am right there with you. I mean, I like everything that we do, we are trusting our equipment. We're trusting the mechanics to put the aircraft back together, whether it's, you know, somebody else or, or us, you know, Coast Guard, they do it internally. So that's, you know, you got the guys in the hangar deck while well, they also fly, you know, so. Oh. You know, yeah. I mean, you, all your aircrafts, you're trusting your mechanics to have all that together and, and done and right. Yeah. Like, put it together right. Uh, as well as all the equipment that we carry, harnesses, uh, rescue baskets, stretchers, you know, all that stuff should be inspected. And when you pull it out to use it, it needs to work, whatever it is. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm on board with that. Um, but, and, and I think what, what allowed us to go back and, and do the job again was that we understood why the cable snapped. The cable didn't just break. It wasn't like we just lifted the winchman off the deck and the cable just broke. Like there was a very valid reason. Like that, I would say that that cable broke under really extreme circumstances because yeah. as I said, there was certain equipment on the side of the aircraft. I think it was like, um, not like a pitot tube, but it was, it was like a piece of equipment that you just go to the side uh, and it was almost like a blade. It was, it was shaped like a blade. It had that kind of sharp edge to it. Um, so that would have been taken and it was just taken clean off the side of the aircraft with the cable so the cable acted like a cheese wire just down along the side of the 61 and just cleaned everything that it met just cut it all so when as I say when it went back to the, to the strut then it actually severed some of those cables though the, the cables that were going out to the sponsors were in like a, a protective casing yeah and, and, it, and it, it cut through part of that as well so that's what the that's what the cable was exposed to or had done before it actually severed. But like, and as I say, then there was a winchman in it, there was a stretcher on it, and there was a, a deceased person in the stretcher with medical kit. So we didn't exceed the limits of the cable, but there was there was weight in it. And then yeah. at the extreme of being swung, so you can imagine the G-forces that's in it. So even though the cable broke, and you could say, well, we're not worried about the cable ever since. Actually, it restored a lot of confidence in the cable because you could see the, the conditions that it could take. Yeah. I think for, for me, it allowed me then to say, well, that's something we can absolutely hang our hat on, because you know, it's an absolutely unbelievable piece of kit. So you, yeah. you had huge confidence then. And I suppose the, the, the lessons learned then is that, again, what allows us to go out in the maritime environment or I suppose any environment is to have two hoists to be able for either one hoist to stop working or a cable to break, whatever the circumstances are. Yeah. That's okay. Let's change over to the other hoist. Yeah. It's we, it was something at the start of our career we couldn't say. Because like, you know, we just had one hoist. So and I think that's what allows us 
to, to, to do our job didn't really I think so bad you know so I I personally love the dual hoist option I use okay. it currently um it's there is it's almost like it's almost being on like a bicycle and wearing a helmet it's that you just you know it's there yeah. it's that safety factor that you don't want to use but if you need it it's right there so you when you it's, crack your head when you fall off your bike and you bang your head you're like oh that wasn't too bad i can get up when the cable or the hoist breaks one you have a backup i love it absolutely and i suppose then it, there has to be a realism then that 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 safety element doesn't lull you into a false sense of security where now you end up pushing the envelope totally. completely so I think yes. you have to kind of yeah. pull yourself back so the, the safety is there to allow you what you're willing to do, what you're able to do within your capabilities, but it's not allow you to do absolutely fucking crazy stuff altogether, like, because I think you're just going to get yourself into trouble in that stage, you know? Agreed. Very much Agreed. so. Yeah. yeah. The, the, wearing a helmet doesn't, uh, doesn't help you with a backflip on a bike. And, you know, you land on your head, you might be breaking your neck no matter what. So, Put your head's perfect. Hey. <laughs> Absolutely, totally agree. Yeah. yeah. So one of the other things I, I'd like to discuss just a little bit with this, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put my two cents in and I yeah. not, here it is. I was not on scene, I was not in the aircraft. So I I don't have a leg to stand on. At the same time, I'm a winch operator, I'm a hoist operator, and I and I get it. And I've had very big swings or pendulums in my cable. What I personally teach, and I, I like this, is when you get something like that. And again, I wasn't on scene. I didn't mm. have one guy plus a, a, a casualty in a stretcher on the cable in, an, in a, such a big, mighty swing. But one of the things that I teach is manhandle that cable, own that cable. So as soon as you start getting that, that type of a swing, you jam into it, whether it's a shoulder, whether it's your arm and like, and trying to work in an opposite direction. Now, if you had two swings or three swings and that cable was, was done, I mean, it, you know, like again, Murphy's law, it is, you know, you, you do your best with what you've got to work with, but um I, I agree agree with you 100 percent and like uh totally get it because i think you can uh, uh physically if you like if you're looking at uh a wind shop and I've, I've only kind of realized this myself after it happened or after you've done it is that you can spot probably a flying suit or an immersion suit from a wind shop who has either tried to dampen out the cable in in something fairly severe uh, as opposed to just a winchman. If you're to put two people standing there side by side, one's a winch up who's just tried to dampen out a swing and the other's a winch man. Uh, the winch up will have a grease line over their right shoulder. Yes. Because as they're, <laughs> because as, uh, as, as they're, trying, to, as they're trying to dampen out that swing, you'll see grease on their, on their right arm or on their right shoulder because they're trying to they're, they're leaning into it. And at, at the moment, you don't realise how much you're leaning into it. It's when you come back into the locker room, you said... Well, that grease get up there on my shoulder, and it's it's because you're it's, it's because you're leaning into the cable. So I totally get it. And and there was other circumstances as to why the swing got so wild. I I, I deliberately didn't touch on it. Um, but yeah, you're you're absolutely one hundred percent. Get 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 your shoulder up to the cable because once it gets out of hand, that's it. Does it's very it's very hard to recover it from the cargo door. So much easier to cover it from from the winchman end, i.e., via highline and stuff like that. But you do absolutely have to get your shoulder push. So definitely, um, definitely. There are a couple other tips and tricks that I like, and with with coming off a vessel, as crazy as it sounds, water does seem to be your friend more than your enemy. And if yeah. you have, if and it, again, I I'm not on scene, but if you have a, a swing or something over water dip them back down in the water just get their feet wet I, you can get new boots i promise you know, <laughs> but a severed cable from 30 feet with a victim in a stretcher is not i i don't yeah. want to be on the end of the cable and watch that happen it's absolutely you know, and also i agree with you and, and it depends on on the circumstances and i think where there's a vessel moving and in heavy sea states we had an incident uh, i won't go into any details but we did have an incident where uh, a winchman came off the back of a boat, uh, ended up in the water, and then was because, as again, as I said, the vessel and the aircraft were still moving. So I totally get that if you're if you're in the hover and you're stationary, 
get him into the water because they can remain in the water. In this particular incident, he came off the back of the boat, ended up in the water, and then ended up being pulled from the water then kind of at speed. So he left his boots and a lot of his equipment behind him. And it in, was the very, in the water, yeah, yeah. It was like he was very lucky not to have very yeah. serious injuries. He had he had some injuries, but let and I think uh, if water is our friend, and I think but in in the right circumstances. So like Agreed. once yeah, once once we can lower Winchman into the water and once he can stay there, absolutely all day long I'll put him into the water because yeah. We, we talk about this from time to time that obviously when we're doing training and we're talking about as we go through a risk assessment uh, and what happens if we get an engine failure, whatever the case is, like what are we going to do with the winch? Are we going to attempt to put them back onto the deck of the, of the vessel? Are we going to cut the cable and leave them in the water? And more and more as, you know, as you, as you get the experience, does a, does a, certainly for me personally, there's a realisation, actually the winchman is dressed perfectly for the water. They're, they're yeah. really nice well. they've really good immersion suits, they've really good life jackets, they've thermal gear underneath it. So yeah, chances are if the conditions are right, you obviously go through it in your assessment and the whole lot. Yeah, leave them in the water. Because the, the danger or to to keep them on the end of the cable if the aircraft has to initiate a flyaway can be far more traumatic. You know, if there's any incident with the cable, I know you end up falling from a height or hitting the water at speed or whatever the case is, you know. Yeah. So Certainly, it, but I think it's it's now with the I suppose how would you say I'm sure it's been around for a while, but now with the the introduction of simulators, yeah. now you can actually try all this stuff. Like when we started off our career, the only the only way you could do the stuff was to actually do it. <laughs> we, right. we, we we couldn't step into a box and then put on a headset or whatever the case was, and know let, well let's see what happens if we cut the cable or let's see what happens this like you, you learned because it happened because the cable was caught or whatever the case was. Totally. So, yeah, whereas now I think you would get a much more uh, astute, a much, uh, how would you say, the wind shops now will have experienced those emergencies in a controlled environment. And I think it will help them to build the pictures that we have now after 20 odd years, whatever the case is, sooner, because now they can go to a simulator and practice these emergencies. Yeah. And I, I I think it's 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 fantastic. And I think it's something that I think we're about to embrace and, and that we'll just get stuck into like, you know, I think it'll make a far better winch operator to be fair. Like it is a tool in the toolbox that you can utilize and I like it. So absolutely, absolutely go for it. Absolutely go yeah. for it. I think we should and utilize all the tools around us. Yeah. And you know what? The great part about you and I talking about this right now is it brings up the conversation. And there, there are so many people that in agencies out there, and like they, they won't talk about it. They, it's it's better now. It's way better now. But before it was nobody would talk about an incident like this. We're like, oh, let's let's not talk about that. Now it's there's there's actual conversation. So the fact that you and I are talking about it and different options that people can do, man, I'm all about it. So yeah, I agree with you 100, Jason. And I think it's something that should be encouraged because it's not about oh, well, you should have done this or you should, or I wouldn't have done that. It's just like, tell me about what happened. And, you know, you can sit there quietly and, and listen and say, fuck, I, you know, I, I would never have even dreamed up a scenario like that. And yeah. and internally then, how would I, as, as an individual, how would I have handled that? And then you can kind of go through it like as a, um, cognitively, you know, and you can now pull it apart in your own head and say, well, well, if this had happened or that happened. And I think it's, but that only happens because you were spoken to the individual that was actually involved in the incident. Right. And I, and I, and I think more, because you need to get the facts out. I'm sure all professions across, you know, all ranges, uh, you hear rumors, you hear Chinese whispers, you hear all this stuff. But I think until you're actually chat, chatting to the people actually involved in the job and you get the facts they know you can actually make a, an absolute informed decision or you can now put a realistic scenario in your head that cognitively you can go through and say, well, if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. And you can kind of better prepare yourself for the next shot of the dark and stormy night. And then yeah, you yeah. <laughs> can head out in, you know, but it, it's all about, I think, certainly as, as winch operators, I think it's all about that mental preparation. You're always kind of, you're always trying to stay the one or two steps ahead but you don't necessarily act in it until step two has been completed. But now I'm actually thinking about step five and six. 
step three has been completed. I'm just, I'm going to try and stay ahead and stay on step seven in my head. Step four has been completed. And I think that's the way you, you break down the rescues in just these bite-sized chunks. Yep. But you're, you're constantly planning ahead and giving yourself the different options, you know? Yeah, different options. Because you know just, it's going to change. Shit's going to change on scene. <laughs> fucking like that. Like that. So it's just amazing. It's just amazing how quickly it can change. Oh, I love it. It's good. That's excellent. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that one and, and the good uh, like conversation about that too. I, I really appreciate that one. So, but oh. um, all right, let's get to another one because this one, uh, this one is is kind of a fun one for me because this, this is very recent, 2021. So just uh, last year, and I specifically remember this rescue happening because it blew up social media, and I was like, what? Uh, so let me uh let me I, this, i'm gonna do two things with this first thing is i'm gonna read right out of the the fishing daily uh which is i guess I in like Ireland. A, yeah it is i think it's a, a magazine or a like a, a newsletter or something that they have yeah the industry the news for today um irish fishing industry yep latest news that's awesome so here's what it says uh crew airlifted from ellie Oh, you said the name. And I, <laughs> what is it? Eliov. Eliov. Yeah. Well, perfect. Like a promo. Eliov. 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 <laughs> Just put your beard and you're right in there. I'm just, <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> All right. So the crew airlifted from the Eliov uh, yeah. as trawler begins to take uh, to take water. And then it goes down a little later and says the Irish Coast Guard responded. No, the Irish Coast Guard has reported that the Irish Coast Guard helicopter 117 was called to airlift seven crew members from the boat as it began to take on water in rough conditions. The boat was under tow by the Irish naval vessel, the Le George Bernard Shaw. Is that right? Le? Yeah. So, the, the Le? Le, the, so it's actually L-E, so it be, I think it should be uh, L dot E dot. And the okay. L-E stands for Long Airn or Irish ship. So that's Got it. just a little bit of history there. A little bit of well, yeah, I just learned something new. The just, oh. the Irish ship, the early the law air. Is that right? Long, long, yeah. Or you could say like long. L O N G long long air. Long long air. Long air. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I'll work on, I promise you I will work on that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Anyway, sorry. So the Cattle Town Bear uh, RNLI lifeboat was also on scene all day assisting with the multi agency operation. Um, yes. In this, it, it goes on to talk about a whole bunch more, but the short version of this is you guys, you and your crew, pulled seven people off this vessel that was taking on water, and the vessel was under tow by the uh, Navy. Um, or the Irish, the Irish naval forces, or Irish navy, right? Yep. Perfect job. In addition to that, um, you and Sarah Courtney, you guys earned a whole bunch of stuff, and you specifically uh, earned a. It's the Bravery Award. Is that yeah accurate? The, the, the National Bravery Award, and I'll be yeah. honest with you, I won't even attempt. I, I myself won't even attempt the Irish version of that, but it it translates into our, the the National Bravery Award. So I got a, a letter or a, a, a commendation from it or whatever you want to call it. And Sarah actually earned a, a medal from it then for her actions, obviously, on the deck of the vessel itself. Oh, uh, that's awesome. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it's, it's recognition rightly deserved. Uh, it was a fantastic operation. It, it's a good news story all around. Uh, and, and it was a really big operation. So as, as the article said, it involved many, many agencies. Yeah. And it actually went on for quite a bit of time. I think it, it, the duration, certainly from the point that we were involved up until where we took the fishermen off, it was already going on for, I think, two days at that stage. So it, it wasn't a, a short-term thing. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the history behind it is that the, the vessel started taking on water. Uh, they obviously requested assistance or, or whatever the case is. And over the course of the two days, the Coast Guard helicopters had been out to them to drop off marine pumps to help them with taking water off the vessel. Uh, and of course, at a certain stage, then it's it's obvious that it's not working anymore. 
I think as all this is happening, the, the weather system is, is building off the West Coast. So, uh, and then it becomes a point then where they can either come back into to shore quickly enough that they can actually get the lads off before it sinks. Um, so they're, they're heading into, into weather, which I think at the time, I think was on a westerly heading, which is is actually away from Ireland. So they're, they're heading away from shore. But that's what they have they to do. They go to America? Pretty much. <laughs> if, if they could have kept going for that amount of time. So like they're, they're, they're under tow and they're into sea. Yeah. So they don't necessarily get to dictate where they want to go. They have to go where they're going. Um, so yeah, when, when we pitched up, we obviously, we had handover shift in Waterford. I think the lads the night before had been on, on standby or something. So we obviously got uh, news that something was happening off the West Coast, but we didn't necessarily know what it was or how serious it was. Uh, so turning on shift and, yeah, going, went through a brief and all that. And I don't think there was anything about it then. And I think it was in the afternoon, then maybe around three or four, four o'clock in the afternoon, we got the call. Can you go down? Um because I think the Shannon machine had been down there, uh, Rescue 116. Uh, they had done their few bits and pieces and they headed away then again. So I think we were called on then after. So we went down, we put uh, an airdrop of a life raft on board the aircraft. We have we have them in stores at the base, so we can put them onto the aircraft. They're not there all the time, we can put them onto the aircraft. Uh, and that was fine. We asked them, to, um, I don't think we took down a marine pump because I think it was decided it was not needed now at that stage. They were going to evacuate the ship. So unbeknownst to us, I think either that morning or at some stage during the operation, life rafts were attempted to be passed to the vessel uh, so that the, the fishermen could get off the boat. And I don't exactly recall why, but the, the, the attempts were unsuccessful. And I think it was partially due to the sea state. Um, I think life rafts were trying to be passed back from the naval ship. So if you like, they inflated it, attached the line to it and try and, and drift it back to the boat. But I think lines parted. I could be wrong in that, but I, I know that there was attempts made to get a life raft to them and they couldn't get a life raft to them. Okay. So this kind of upped the ante a bit now because now the fishermen have no way of getting off the boat, even if they kind of want it. So that kind of increases the risk a bit now because if the boat does sink, well, where are they going to go? They can't just pop into a life raft. So... We uh, are en route to the scene. We land on in, in Castletown Bear. It's, it's a refueling site that we have there. We take on extra fuel, so it gives us an extra bit of time on scene. And we pitch up on scene. Then, so from a distance, you can obviously see the sea state is, is quite bad. But at a distance, you don't really see the movement on the ships. You just see the, maybe the white water. You might see a couple of dark patches where there's troughs or whatever the case is. So you can, you can say, yeah, that's... That's that's a handy enough sea state there, right, Chad? Uh, like from about 1,500 feet, whatever the case is, you're quite a bit off. So as you get closer then, you're looking out the window and you say, yeah, that's, there you draw your, your so yeah, that, that sea state is building there, right? You know, you can you kind of see what all the talk is about, all right, certainly. So then we get closer then again. So you can now really see how how bad the sea state is. So, and it, it was pretty bad. I I think they put it in as, as 10 meters or something on the, on the actual reports and stuff. I have to be oh, honest, as as I, I was only talking about this recently, as long as I've been doing search and rescue, I find it very hard to gauge uh, heights of waves. I'm, I'm a disaster at it. I kind of judge it by, we can winch in that or we can't. That's how I kind of <laughs> judge, that's how I kind of judge it. And, and if I think it's anyway too risky at all, it's like, no, we won't be winching today and that's it. So, so it was, it was particularly bad. So, we pulled in alongside uh, the vessel itself just to do a kind of overall assessment. So we're, we're a nice bit off. There's no threat to the aircraft or anything like that. We can see that the boat moving. We can see the, the Bernard Shaw ahead, uh, which has a tow line established between the back of the vessel and the bow of the trawler. So, uh, and we can see the live boat then is back behind us then as well. So it, it's almost kind of like a, a line, like a convoy. There's no line between the lifeboat and the trawler that they're independent, if you like. There's no attachment. So, but there's a line connecting the trawler and the naval vessel. So we pull in for a bit. We let the aircraft settle down, and I suppose we kind of let ourselves settle down in as well, because we know we've a bit of work to be doing here now. So we're taking everything on board. The cargo door is open. 
we're having a good look out, we're assessing everything. So there, there's two things then immediately to let you know that, that things are quite serious. And the first most obvious thing is that everybody on the trawler is dressed in their neoprene survival suit. So nobody knows a fishing boat like the fishermen on it. Yeah. And if they're, if they're dressed in immersion suits, well, then you know something's not right and they want to get off the boat. And there's your yeah. first clue that things are serious because fishermen, and, and I totally get it, a, a fishing trawler is much more than just a boat. It's, it's a workplace. It's a home place. It's a place where they get good news. It's a place where they get bad news. Like the attachment for a fisherman to a trawler is just absolutely phenomenal. And I suppose maybe for ourselves as well to a helicopter or to a plane, there's just that extra little bit of attachment to it. It's not just the workplace. It's, it's, it's something far more special than that. So when you see those lads on the deck and they're ready to go, you know then, right, this is, this is serious now at this stage. So you look forward and you follow the tow line, the tow line through the water and up onto the end of the George Bernard Shaw. And every now and again, the waves are just cutting through the, the tow line. So she disappears between the crests of the waves. She emerges from it then again. So when a boat is under towed in, it, it doesn't act naturally as it would, obviously, free of a tow, because sometimes right. the tow line is pulling it down or pulling it up. Or, you know, there's, there's that extra little bit of movement um, with it as well. So when you look forward in, and I think I verbalized it, and I said, Jesus Christ, look at that. And the, the whole back of the naval ship um, just rose completely out of the water. And you can see the, the props and the rudder. Like, uh, and then she Turn just it. turning wow. it. And then, then, then you can just see it slamming into the water. And then there's a huge flume of, of water just rises. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it before with a boat in, in a sea state. And it, it's just that violent action of the ship as she's going through the water. So it said to me then straight away, right, this is, this is actually quite violent. The sea state here now is actually quite violent when it's doing that to the ship. And I, I just never seen anything. As you can imagine, there was absolutely nobody on deck of the naval ship, which in itself is quite unusual because there's always somebody pottering around and doing something on it. So the conditions are just too bad to have anybody outside. So we're on the, uh, so back to the trawler then again, we're doing our assessment. So at that stage, then as a wind shop, you just kind of have to, you have to look at the, the realities and you have to eliminate the distractions. And for me, looking at the, the naval ship was a distraction. It was the most impressive thing that I've ever seen with, with nature like that, moving a man-made object just like that. Just It was just like, <laughs> I still never get over it like that it can just treat it like a toy. It's just, it's yeah. just a thing. But right now, in, in the scenario that we're in, it's just a distraction. I, I can get no information from that vessel watching it, as watching its movement, other than the type of sea state that's there. So... Back to the vessel itself then. So the vessel then is rolling quite a bit. So she's almost going from railing to railing. So she's just gone over. So when we're in the harbour, taking in this overall picture, you can, some of the hatches are open where the, the hoses from the marine pumps are going down into the, the trawler. Yeah. And you can, you can see the water inside and the vessel just sloshing around inside. And I was quite shocked. That it, from where we were at, it looked quite close to the hatch. I don't know. I can't give a height on it. So I was quite shocked at how much water was in there and just to see everything sloshing around inside. So for me then, potentially that the boat was very unstable and it could go at any time. Because you hear of, of boats being incredibly unstable in bad weather when there's water on board, if they go below a certain line and then they'll just, they'll just go like that. Yeah. So I was, I was conscious of that. So you could see all the water sloshing around inside. But she was, every now and again, then she would roll or she would pitch then also bow up and, and stern down. Um, and from time to time, that will get really violent and really fast. But as you know yourself, when you when you step off and you look at a boat, there's a, there's almost like a pattern. So you you get a you'll get a violent period, and you'll get, you'll get a necessarily calm period, or where it's less violent, and then you may get another violent period, or whatever the case is. But you will see a pattern develop, and then I think as as crew certainly as a wind shop you're looking for that pattern you're looking for your window of that calmness or less violence where it can just 
there's a five second gap or a 10 second gap there where I can get something on or get something off the boat. So that's what I'm looking for in all this chaos and all like the carnage and the immersion suits and the whole lot. That's actually what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that little gap. So we do our briefs and we decide that we're going to deploy a high line, obviously initially with the sea state and that we're going to deploy, as I say, our airdroppable life raft onto the deck. So the kind of problem that we have is that the airdroppable life raft, as the name would suggest, is it's designed just to be dropped from the aircraft. And when it yep. hits the water, you can pull a line and it inflates. But it's designed to land into water, not onto a solid surface of a, of a steel deck. Because obviously, if you, if you throw it onto a steel deck, you're going to trash it. Yeah. Um, and the other thing about it is that there's a large uh, CO2 bottle inside them, which is fairly close to the, to the actual valise that it's wrapped in. So when certain parts of the life raft are, are, are softish, uh, but you can actually feel where the bottle is. So if you throw it out and it hits somebody, it's just, that's, that's it. That's lights out. And that's, that's a game changer right there. And then, so yeah. they're knocked the beep out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the, our next problem that we had, or our next issue that we had there now, is how do we get this airdrop or life raft onto the deck, uh, onto the steel deck of a trawler without damaging it, without obviously first priority, without hurting anybody on the deck, without damaging the life raft, and so that it can still be operational if they need it. We don't know because we haven't done this before because it's not you don't practice to put an airdrop or life raft onto the deck of a ship. So there was a little bit of quick thinking. So we have um, plenty of high line inside in the aircraft so there's two things you can be absolutely hang your hat on you can be dead certain you will find on the deck of a trawler that's a sharp knife and a strong arm those two <laughs> things and they're they're pretty much the two things that i wanted so i, that, I had a that is such head. a true statement too <laughs> <laughs> but it absolutely is like it's just it, it's just phenomenal so i had a plan so we obviously discussed it amongst the crew. So what we did is we made up just kind of various loops of high line and maybe about eight feet tall. So what I wanted is I wanted to be able to connect the life raft to the rescue hoist hook, deploy the life raft to the deck of the vessel, but still for the trawler, for the fishermen to be able to take the life raft from the hook without going near the mechanism of the hook. Because as you know, uh, from operating on the hook. It, it's not a simple, oh, you just open the hook. Like, you know, right. you have to push in the little yellow tabards and, and pull back with your fingers. So, and you guys are using the LSC hook, right? The, um, yeah, that's it. The, uh, the, oh my, the D lock. Yes, that's yeah. it. So, yeah. there's, there's a locking mechanism on it. Yep. So, so, for those that don't use that, there's two yellow tabs on either side. You pinch both yellow tabs, it opens up. You release it, the, the snap, the gate closes and both tabs close to keep it locked. And it, both tabs have to be pressed in order to unlock that hook. So a little different than some of the other hooks that are out there, but um, one of my favorites personally. So Brilliant. anyway. And it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and so trying to explain that to somebody over the radio, there's, there's complications with it. So there's always a fear that they're not going to get it. And communi communications weren't great with the noise of the helicopter. There's quite a... Uh, high wind state there as well so even just and they, all they had was a handheld radio that was passed to them from the previous crews because their electronics was gone on the boat so they didn't they weren't sitting in the wheelhouse or anything like that they were just on the deck with a handheld radio so i said right so how do we rig it up get the life raft onto the deck where they don't have to operate the hook but can still actually receive the life raft from us so we just created loops loops and loops and loops of high line the life raft itself is quite heavy so loops and loops of high line uh, and secured with a carabiner on top through the handles of the life raft. So the, the life raft is just sitting as it should level underneath the aircraft. So we got, so we had to get, we still had to get the high line established at this stage. So we, as you can imagine, all this, all these calculations or different scenarios are going through our head. So we had it decided with the, the life raft. So then we said, right, we're going to deploy the high line. So we put on loads of weights onto the end of the high line. That was quite heavy also. So with the wind um, strength that was there, the weights were hanging directly beneath the aircraft, but the high line was still bowed, almost like a like a C, like the letter C, because the wind is catching the high line. The wind is so heavy. The wind is so heavy, and it's just yeah. blowing back the high line. So I said, okay, yeah, right, that's grand. Actually, and I thought, well, that's actually still good because the weights are still, I put on enough weights that it was just hanging directly beneath the aircraft. 
and that's fine. Yeah. So we maneuvered the aircraft in to uh, drop off the high line. So as we got closer to the boat, the, the high line weights just started drifting slightly back. So we maneuvered the aircraft slightly forward. So fair play to Ronan, he was the, the captain and absolutely handled it beautifully. So had very little visuals because we're up at a nice height. We want to clear all the obstacles because the, the vessel is rising and falling maybe, I don't know, 30, 35 feet. So we, you, you needed to, you, you, yeah, you needed, you needed to build in that little bit of that little bit of fat there to make sure that nothing tipped the aircraft. So yeah, and then plus with the height of the trawler itself, the aerial is probably about eighty feet as well. So we were up at about one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty feet. Maneuvered in, got the high line weights onto the deck, perfect. Started drifting back, but that sea, that bow that was in the high line, as the the ship rolled and was pitching downward, the aerials that are on the, the wheelhouse got snagged in the high line. So now the, now the high line starts to wrap around the, oh the aerials. Oh my gosh. And I, I remember I didn't put it as politely as that, Jason, but I do remember thinking to myself, <laughs> like it was going what so- What the son of a good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> So a lot of foul language in there. <laughs> oh, internally, internally, I tried to keep professional. So, of oh, course, of course, Ron ICS. I, I, absolutely, yeah. So the, the, the rope was entangled in, on the aerials, and I said, "Oh." So I had held the the high line in my hand, so it was connected onto the hook, but I had held it in my hand, and I actually disconnected it from the hook because I said, "If it gets snagged where it's going to be pulled, I can just release it." I know it's not connected to the aircraft anymore. Brilliant. There is. There is there is a weak link on it, but I said, you know what? Yeah. This, yeah. this hand is definitely going to work because <laughs> I, yeah. I am going to let it go. So I held it in my hand and uh, you could see that the lads could on the deck could see what the problem was. So you could see him looking up at the, the mast and like that, one of the lads just turned, walked down by the side of the wheelhouse and started climbing up the mast, the solid mast. And then started reaching out and untangling the high line from the, the aerials. And I do remember verbalizing, if this thing is going to go pear-shaped and if somebody's going to be seriously hurt, it's going to happen in the next two minutes. Because if he comes down off the aerials, he's just going to be absolutely, definitely seriously injured, if not killed. So it worked out. So he, he, he unwrapped us, climbed down the side of the wheelhouse again, and went back around to where he was standing. And the high line had managed to go back up around we were I, I wasn't fast enough to patter the aircraft forward enough to keep visuals for the pilot to maintain good references and keep the high line away from the the aerial and what i should have done was pulled in the, the high line faster as well but the wind speed was was quite significant yeah and the danger is that when you're pulling in the the rope to try and and straighten out that bow is that tension is kind of transferred down the high line and the lads think that you're trying to actually pull in the high line which I didn't really want to do. I wanted them to have the high line. Yeah. So with that, your man had just arrived back down the deck and was starting to give the lads a hand. And then they, they pointed up at it again. And he didn't even bat an eyelid. Like, you know, I was expecting, like, you know, oh, I have to go back on. He didn't even bat an eyelid. He just turned, went back around, went back down, <laughs> the road, went back up onto the mast. And I remember saying, we're never going to get away with it a second time. There's just absolutely no way we're going to get away with it a second time. So he, oh he went back gosh. up. Un unwrapped it again and came back down again. So this time I said, I owe it to this man not to get it tangled in the aerials again. I absolutely owe it to that man. So kept the better management of the high line, pulled it in a little bit more tense and maneuvered the aircraft around in where I said, right, the high line is fine. We weren't necessarily in the position exactly that we wanted to be in, but I explained that I said, we have to stay this far forward because the high line is drifting back and getting caught in the aerials. That's fine. We can work with this. So high line established, brilliant. It, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of things now, you know, because now we've an established line between the aircraft and the vessel. So next thing now is to get the life raft down onto the deck. So we had radio to the life raft will be dropped down T. And as soon as the life raft hits the deck, just cut the lines. And I was quite happy just to say, cut the lines. And if they cut the high line, okay, we can reestablish another high line. But I was yeah. just happy once the life raft is there, that's going to change it also. So, like I said, 
strong arm, sharp knife, so the life raft went out. And the life raft is, is there's a nice bit of weight in it. I think I think it weighs 35 kgs. And as I say, with that, oh wow, yeah, with that, I think it's either pounds or kgs, but it, it, it's up there. It, it, there is a nice bit of weight in it. And with that CO2 cylinder inside it as well. Yeah. So, so if it's it just for all my imperial friends, if it's thirty five kg, it's about seventy pounds ish. Like it's, it's not yeah. it's not light. It's it's no, got some it's, weight to it. It's substantial, yeah. So it's it's a wrecking ball, really. So brought it out, kept the aircraft off a nice bit out, and and the lads just absolutely played out of their socks with the high line. Kept a really good tension on the line. So my biggest fear is that you would that when if they let the, any bit of slack in the high line, that you would develop a swing where the weight would start coming towards them but no absolutely brilliantly so literally as soon as the life raft landed on the deck man just all i could see was just an arm going across like that and he obviously had a knife in his hand and he must have cut through because as i said the the high line was looped and there must have yeah. been about like six or eight high lines together and he must have just went through the whole lot of them in a, in a shot like just like a hot <laughs> knife to the butter bang so it's gone so high line stayed <laughs> on the deck awesome. Highline stayed on the deck, and uh, I remember winching back in, and the highline was still established. Oh, I was like, yes, because now the highline is still connected. I don't have to re-establish it. And it was kind of like a dummy deck for us. It was like a free exposure. We had been into the overhead. We had dropped off a life raft. We'd recovered the hook. Highline was still together. Actually, do you know what? This has worked. And I remember saying that this has worked. So... Then what happens then is uh, we radioed in, I think, the Bernard Shaw, and we say, uh, what's your intentions? And he said, well, if you can attempt to take the seven fishermen off, um, that would be great because we think the vessel is going to sink. But, oh. And I think they had explained that uh, we tried to deploy life rafts, but it's unsafe either for them to get into them. Or... I remember there just been an issue with the life rafts anyway. So we thought, right. So then we went from the, the, the complete elation of like, yeah, it worked. To know, oh, we have to go back into it again and do more work. It's like, oh, okay. So now the ante was upped again because now we're dealing with, no, it's not a life raft at the end of the cable anymore. They, they, we're putting a winchman at the end of the cable. So, you know, you, you can bang a life raft, you might bust the boat, you might damage the life raft. It, it's equipment. It's not a human life. It's equipment. It can be replaced. No, we're putting a human life at the end of the cable. No, we're putting the winchman at the end of the cable. So... Stuff got serious. It was always serious, but you know, it was just that anti was up a little bit. So rebriefed the whole act in again. So you never, so there's been a change in scenario. So there must be a change in brief. So we rebriefed the whole thing then again. And I remember turning to, to Sarah, the winchman, and it was the only time really that I said it. Uh, and it was the only time I have to say, Jason, that in, in my career, where you're knowingly putting a winchman into danger. Do you know yeah. where you were we are saying this is this is actually fucking dangerous is what, what i'm doing here now this is actually dangerous because i think people have uh an impression that we do this all the time but the those those big jobs those 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 wouldn't what i'm going to call one in a lifetime career where you're where you're making the big calls you're saying this is dangerous and i'm going to commit or i'm going to ask the winchman to commit to this yeah so it's like fuck, right <laughs> Come on. Uh, so fair play then uh, we went through it and I said Sarah what do you think and she says yeah and she says but I'm not going to take down the straps with me initially and uh, she said we can sort that out after I'm just going to get on the deck first uh, and at first I kind of struggled with it and I said oh but I have to, I'm going to have to try and get the straps in when I when I think back on it no and when I when I thought back on it after that was such a great judgment call by Sarah to make because it meant both her hands were free. She had nothing else to worry about, only to get onto the deck. And if she couldn't get onto the deck, well, then what was the point of worrying about straps? So yeah. I think it was so it was such a great judgment call. And, you know, at the time, literally at the time inside the aircraft, for a second, I kind of struggled with it. And then I went with it and I said, okay. So prepared Sarah at the door, went through the, the kit. And like, as I say, the other first time in my career then was like, are you happy with your stats battle? Are you happy with your inflation handle for the life jacket? Because my biggest fear is not necessarily that she would go overboard, but that she would get pinned under the rail. So like, because like, as I said, as I said earlier, winchmen are excellently dressed for the maritime environment. Right. But being trapped is being trapped. So 
if the, you went overboard and now the boat rolled and pinned you with the railing or if you got knocked unconscious or whatever the case is that was actually kind of what was i was thinking about there so yeah went through all those checks that was fine um winch at the door check clear to winch all green inside winching in lifted winchman up off the deck uh and started winching out winching out so start closing the aircraft in on the vessel watching for those windows watching for the the big waves to coming through so there was one or two waves coming through so it's just steady holding off here the fishermen were absolutely excellent on the high line like unbelievable so they just held her they didn't try and, and pull her onto the onto the vessel or anything like that they just held her so it's just right watching the next wave coming through okay it's a little bit steady just right to and it's just right one and then it's like feet are over the railing Winchman is on the deck off the hook, check left, winching in. That was it. Winchman was on the deck. I was like, yes. So yes. All, these, all these emotions are going through your head, like where it's like, phenomenal work has been done. But then actually the work is only starting because we've just got the winchman onto the deck. So now let's get the straps onto the deck. Much easier job insofar as that it's equipment, but you can never take your eye off the focus because you can't this the soon as you take your eye off the focus that's when you're going to get caught so you treat the straps literally as the winchman because if you don't something's going to happen you're going to take your eye off something and it's going to catch you so the straps went on then that's brilliant pull back winched in stare did our work put the straps on straps around the survivors check clear to run in yeah, ready, in, in the overhead, uh, straps around the cable, just waited for a second for the boat to rise up, winching in, winching in, clear left, off to the left, uh, two survivors out over the water, winching in. So the first two were off the boat. Brilliant. You guys, so, you're hoisted two at a time in straps. Hoisted, hoisted okay. two at a time. For the situation that it was, Smart. we couldn't... We couldn't, yeah. we couldn't afford to just have one or whatever. And I'll be honest with you, Jason, if there were seven straps there, I would have taken them fucking all at once because it was just like, <laughs> oh, man. So, and that's grand. So the, the first two, uh, so about the first two casualties are off. Brilliant. So now we just have to go back in and do it again. So back in and do it again. And I think it was either on, yeah, it was on the second one that we went back in then. I had delivered the straps to Sarah and then... A big wave she just went down the, the vessel went down into a big wave into a big trough and everybody just kind of shunted forward if you like and sarah had kind of placed herself very well uh against a, a drum where there was large ropes you know for for hauling in the trawls and stuff yeah so it was actually a good position because it was like the, the ropes were, were comfortable i'd imagine and um she kind of had pinned herself into the corner there which is brilliant because she could use her hands now just for straps or whatever she just had wedged herself in there but when the two lads fell forward they fell onto sarah and they absolutely like pinned her into that corner there you know and i thought oh i said that's gonna hurt because i remember saying geez that's gonna hurt because they were they were big lads like they were towering over sarah you know yeah. so that was fine then everybody kind of got to themselves composed themselves again and i remember radio and said, you're all right sarah and it was just thumbs up so there was no chatter or anything on the polycom which is a fantastic piece of kit they just thumbs it up that was grand ready to go back in next two survivors off brilliant so uh i don't know if it's true or not but i'll tell you a great little story about when we were telling uh the naval ship and uh valencia about when we're sent and the next two casualties are off so back in for the next two so that's we got them off that's six casualties now we have off the boat so there's only one man left so I remember thinking to myself, this is actually going to be the tricky one because now there's nobody tending the highland. Yep. Because the lads were tending the highland absolutely beautifully, but now there's nobody on the highland. So it's a case of right back in, treated exactly the same, but we absolutely have to wait for the weather window or that wave window where the vessel just comes up right and we just take them off all over the edge of the rail. And then so, and it was straight back in. Sarah has the hook in hand. She's on the hook, winching in, and then it was just steady. And I was just waiting for the boat to rise up, steady, and then winching in, check left, clear left, 
move left and back, call one of the short targets. No high line nor anything was established, so we could move wherever we wanted now because there was no high line established. Move left and back, call one of the short targets. So it's my target, winching in, down to five. I think we came down, we dropped the height in uh, down a little bit, not much because the, the vessel is still there. Uh, winch man survivor on board, on dispatcher harness, off the hook, stone the hoist, and it was like, yeah, well, oh, <laughs> telling fuck that's over. It was like, oh, man. So last radio transmission into the boat to say we have all seven fishermen off the vessel. Uh, thank you so much for your work for the tow line. They still had to stay there because they still had now a boat under tow. So I really, at that moment, I actually really felt sorry for them. Said we're going home. Yeah, they're staying there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're staying there. So I really felt for the lads in the lifeboat, the lads and women in the lifeboat, and the lads and women in the naval ship because they were there. They were stuck there for I think another night until eventually the boat sank in the following day. Uh, but then you, you kind of have to bring it back to reality. And I do remember giving myself a reality check. Just stop with the emotion. Job still has to be done. We have to get back to Cork Airport. Right. We're You're not pub. done yet. We're, we're not you, done. You've done the first half. You've got yeah, yeah. the people off the vessel and into the aircraft. Yeah. Do you know, well done. But actually, there's more work to be done. Crack on. Yep. So it's like, oh, man. So backed in into Cork Airport uh, and eventually. So there, there was loads of chit chat on, on the radio, um, chatting to the Navy board. They were all obviously very thankful and the whole lot. So we got back into Cork Airport. So so just before I forget it, um, when we were bringing the casualties off the, the trawler and saying to the to the pilot, could you pass it on to the co-pilot was, could you pass it on to the naval ship that we've two casualties off? Uh, I don't know how true it is, but the messages were being relayed back to MRSC Valencia, who was the, the, the coordinating centre for all the, the radio traffic and for all the vessels and everything at sea involved in the operation. I don't know how true it was, but apparently when when they heard that like there were just two casualties off board or off the vessel, it was like, hey! there's just like a big beer inside the control station. Like, I was like, hey, two more. And then like, you know, and there's two more casualties. Hey, there's two more. It's brilliant. Yeah. So I don't know how true that is. I would love to think oh, that this I love it. Because like, I think it's a fantastic story. To, you can imagine everybody sitting around the radio because they're they're in a, a control station miles away. And all they can they can only build a picture from what they hear through the radio. So you can imagine yeah. the excitement of like two off. <laughs> so um, yeah, back into the Cork Airport then. Uh, there was ambulances and all that stuff. So the the the, the fishermen themselves were in good health. They were incredibly tired because as I said, that was an operation that was going on for two full solid days. Those lads hadn't slept. Like their boat was full of water. They were, they were dressed in immersion suits. There was, there was constantly work to be done because you know your boat's taken on water. You also know you can't shift it fast enough, but you can shift it enough just to buy you enough time to kind of get you another bit, if that makes sense. So yeah, the guys have to clean the filters and the pumps. So they have to, they were, every now and again, they have downtime for the pumps. And they knew that while the pumps were down, while they were doing their bits and pieces, more water was coming in. So uh, when they got the pumps up and running again, they were just getting off the water that had just come in. So they were they were constantly against this ticking time bomb of where there was just a little bit of extra water coming in, just a yeah. little extra bit of water that they could never shift. They were constantly in negative equity and they were just tipping away the whole time. So imagine for them on board the boat, knowing that this is happening and they, and they went through it morning, noon, night. Do you know, so at night time, knowing all this is going on, and they had no power on the boat, all power was gone, so they're working in the darkness at times as well. So, uh, yeah, back into Cork Airport, uh, had the debrief and all that kind of stuff. Then, and then I remember I had a couple of days off, uh, after that, and I, th I think Sarah had as well. I think we all it just worked out in the roster, we just had a couple of days off after it, and I remember being. Mental, I remember the day after being mentally and physically just absolutely shattered, just wrecked, just absolute. And then I think that's when it, it took its toll on me then to say that was massive. You know, it was only when I was going through that, the mental tiredness just, yeah. just wrecked. I just didn't want to do anything. You know, get up in the morning, make a cup of tea, and just wander around the place with a cup of tea in my hand and just not think about anything because. The whole idea of making decisions, no, forget about it. 
And I remember my left side being quite sore because I, I was I was clearly holding on to the high line more than what I thought. A bit like what we were saying earlier with the cable getting our shoulder into it. Yeah. And and my line, I, I think I probably would have lifted <laughs> probably would have lifted the shoulder out of the water. Certainly yeah. that's how I felt. But <laughs> you're just there. So I, I do as an Irishman. <laughs> oh, to be sure so like it was just that that strength obviously you know you, you were working overtime uh both yeah. mentally and physically so I, I do remember after just being absolutely shattered like uh so it, it does the the big rescues and you know not all of them make the news not all of them get recognized right. but they all do take their toll like yeah physically and mentally and, and some of them are positive and so you get a great feeling of elation which was the emotions with that we went through all the emotions with that one and then some of them aren't so positive you know it can, it, they can be quite harrowing or, or they're just quite negative on you then as well like you know so but it was uh yeah and and that was it <laughs> that is one hell of a story was holy that? amazing your entire crew uh your pilots your winchmen you my gosh well done yeah. it was, uh, was yeah, awesome it was not I, it was good. can i can i debrief like three things off this can we can go we open it. up that conversation one more time go, go for All it right. go for. so for those that don't know the hardest thing to do as a hoist operator or as a winch operator is to hoist from a moving helicopter to a moving vessel and putting somebody in with big waves. That is the hardest thing to do as a winch operator. There's there's not anything that I've done that's harder than that. And, and I for so again, amazing job for you and your crew because 30 foot seas or 10 meter waves is big. A boat that isn't like under power is not you it there there is you have to find that pattern. You have to you have to find a finesse to get in there. You, it's not just a, oh, let's just go. Do You're not on a side of a mountain or, or in a in a treed area. There's so yeah. much dynamically moving pieces and parts. It's ridiculous. So yeah, hardest thing. That's the first thing. The next one, have you guys, or do you use uh, what I remember us calling it in the Coast Guard? And it's one of the things I teach now is crossing the T or dotting the I with a, a high line or tag line. And the reason I bring this up is you guys had come up and you asked, you actually said you kind of did it, but you moved the helicopter over the top of the vessel and then dropped your weight bag, your high line onto the vessel and then moved back to the left, right? Yeah. Is that is that standard operating procedure for you guys? Yeah, it will be. Uh, like some lads would put the, it, it, sometimes in, in high wind states, you can almost deploy the high line directly because the speed of the weight falling through the ground is not interfered by the wind so if yep. that makes sense so you're literally yep. for want of a better word you're literally bombing the target with the lead weight yes because you you, you want it to pass through the wind so fast that it's not interfered or anything and then other times but it wasn't that type of deck where you could just literally come in overhead and you know and and pick a spot to, to bomb it so to speak because it was just moving too much so even though it was a little bit slower and I suppose maybe a little bit more tedious, I put the weights out. I know I could kind of maneuver the aircraft in, even if the, the captain didn't have the appropriate visuals, they could yeah. go on the platter and just maneuver the aircraft slowly. So, yeah. and, and that was the option we went for then at that, like, you know. So I call that technique, uh, like a crossing the T where you oh, have man. your high line out, let's say, 30 feet below the aircraft so it's just off the water and as the aircraft moves over the boat the the line the high line uh guideline trail line whatever you want to call it ends yeah, up yeah. running into that spot you cross it the the oh. lead weight gets put on and then you slide back to the left so i i just call it crossing the t and, yeah, yeah, and what yeah, yeah. it does for the pilot side is as you're coming across if they lose visual reference they've gone to let's say the right they lose yeah. visual reference, and then they immediately come to the left, same altitude, They but they've never actually stopped the aircraft. So it's a drift to the right, yes. and then immediately move to the left, and you've gotten your tagline on deck. Oh, so, brilliant. Yeah. What, what I have seen some lads do is when they when they put the high line weight out the door, is they would almost like throw it out the door. If you like, they yeah. almost like induce a swing. So as you're patterning the aircraft over, the high line weight actually gets to the rail and long before you do. 
I, yeah. which I think uh, it's a technique I haven't mastered and I, I, I probably haven't even tried it enough but I've seen some lads do it and it works really well because now the aircraft can stay way off pilot can keep their visuals and now the high line is established it's, yeah. it's a really good technique but it, it does take quite a bit of practice as I say it's something I haven't mastered yet you know and that's something that kind of practice you got to have a lot of flight time to be able to do or at least play with it on a tower quite a bit before you get into the aircraft so <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, no, I I really like how you guys did that to get the tagline or I'm sorry, high high line, the high line. yeah, yeah, the high onto line. the vessel. Like yeah. I, I love it, and any option that you can do to do that is a another, like I said, a good conversation to have. Um, so the Absolutely. last one that I really want to touch on, and this is again something that that I teach, and um, I I recommend it to everybody. And that is a practice run or a rehearsal. Now, you guys had that opportunity with the raft. It gave you that perspective. There was nothing on the on the hook and, and not a live body. And, and you had options to get out of it. It wasn't a big deal if if things went sideways or south or you didn't like it and you had to cut away. No, no problem. Yeah, a yeah. rehearsal is free. And I love the fact that you said that. It's like, it was like a practice run. Yeah, highly recommended and and high speed. Well done, yeah, awesome, yeah. absolutely. And like it, it's absolute gold because I think no matter what's going on on the scene, is you have to have that practice run because we we had it with the high line as you say, and we had it obviously with the the life raft. And I'm pretty sure, even though I didn't recall it, that we would have done a dummy run because it's it's absolutely everything. We always do it, uh, whether it's overland, over water, and to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter what's happening on the scene, no matter how 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 much of an emergency it is because it's never that much of an emergency that you risk when you're in the overhead or on the route in not seeing something to the detriment of the winchman or the aircraft totally. so it's just dummy run everybody happy yeah let's go live and then that's it then you can you can obviously go live then after that you know but yeah absolutely yeah. Dummy, dummy run is key dummy run yeah it's key definitely without a shadow of a doubt man this has been awesome uh nick they, i like i i have loved that was Oh my gosh. I am so psyched <laughs> I got to hear this story like firsthand. I, I really, I really have been dying to hear this in particular story. I'm like, I was reaching out to everybody out there. I'm like, come on, you guys, I really want to hear this story. <laughs> Thank you for coming on and sharing that one. Um uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to actually talk to you, one more thing is is just the um you actually had an incident where you got into a pretty bad spin and which is gonna the reason I'm bringing this up is because what I'd like to talk about is you went from all three roles in the aircraft and now you are currently doing one role in the aircraft and, and in your ups and downs and and what you did to get through all that mental health and physical health and everything. And if that's cool and and you're willing to share some of that, I'd love to touch on that just a little bit. Uh, And you know, and thank you, Jason for for bringing it in and and i suppose for allowing me to chat about it and i think it's it's something that's very close to my heart and and obviously to my head as well but uh it's it's something we kind of need to normalize you know it's just having a chat uh because i think in any profession you can't go through a a career no matter how short or how long it is we're hoping affected by it in some way but yeah you you touched on it there so back in 1998 actually with with the alouette tree again i went into a spin and it it was quite a violent um, spin where I blacked out. I, I have no recollection of hitting the water, none whatsoever. And the wow. winchman that was in the Alouette at the time uh, is still with us and still working with me down below in, in Waterford. Uh, I remember chatting to him about it at the time and I said, well, what did it look like like from, from you, from looking down? And he said, I actually could not identify like your hands from your feet. So he said, you were just a blur on the end of the cable. And I said, well, okay. Well, it certainly felt like that. So... <laughs> I just like I my, my biggest fear at the time you was blacked that, out. Yeah, I'm sure it did feel like that. <laughs> yeah, I just completely blacked out. I do remember before I passed out that the my arms and my legs, it's like there was a person on each limb and they were pulling in opposite directions. And my helmet strap uh was catching under my chin. And I remember saying, oh, that's really digging into my chin. It was getting quite painful and it was just kind of on my Adam's apple here, or whatever. My helmet was being pulled. And it was just catching there. And I thought, that's really fucking sore. And I need to undo my chin strap is what I wanted to, to do. But I remember 
I didn't have the strength just to bring down my hand and undo the strap. My hands were just pinned back like this. And I couldn't, I'm not the world's strongest man, but I just couldn't even physically get a hand down to undo the chin strap. Wow. So I remember waking up in the water and it was light, it was dark, it was light, it was dark. And I remember like, I can't breathe. And I started, to, in my mind, I started swimming. I imagine I just started trashing the water. So, but I'm under the water at this stage and uh, the wind chop can see me. And he says, like, I, he says, I saw you. And he says, you were actually swimming down the way. He says, you weren't, you weren't making any sense in the water. He says, you were swimming down the way. Like, so he elected and rightly so. And I think it's the importance of that no matter what, what's happening on the end of the cable to stay on the cable. Because if you lose control of your own actions or if you get knocked unconscious, well, obviously you're not going to attach in. But even if you're faced in a situation where you think this has all gone hairy, this has all gone wrong, stay. I would, I would personally say stay on the cable because you now have another person who is capable, obviously, of making logical decisions and life-saving decisions, and they're going to get you out of it. So I stayed on the cable. He elected to, to win chain was absolutely the right thing to do. So as I was in the water, as I was saying, seeing light and dark and light and dark, I was kind of rolling in the water. So the cable was rolling around my waist. So as he winched in, then I obviously rolled back the way as the cable is coming away from my waist. And then I came up out of the water feet first. So at some stage, obviously, the chin strap did open on the helmet. I came up feet first. And all he saw as the wind shock was the helmet just going off in the distance. Just he was he was like the cable we had in the Alouette was only 90 feet tall. So you're never more than 90 feet away from the person, and we weren't at the full extent of the cable. So he was fully convinced at that stage then that he had decap decapitated me. Because the hel the helmet the helmet just the helmet just stayed in the water right way up. But he couldn't see my head, he could only see the soles of my boots. So eventually I rised myself on the cable and he thought, wow, he still has a head. So I was like, <laughs> brilliant. My, my head must have I'm been- I'm sorry to laugh, Nick, that's No, no, funny. but you're right. But yeah, like, like when I recall it now, like it's like, wow, when you think back on it, like, you know, so my head must have just been blood red and it felt certainly massive. And he winched me back up into the aircraft. So he was absolutely snow white because of everything that he had seen and what he thought he had just did. And the captain, as I said, was in the, the Alouette, which is quite small. And he just turned around and thought, what's going on? Because <laughs> like, there's one person with a big red head and there's one person with a big white head. So like, what, <laughs> what's going on? So my helmet was inside in the water. Uh, and I think I remember, which is absolutely the right thing to do, was the wind shop saying, I'm going to put you back down to get your helmet. Because he, he has to shout over the noise. Of that, and I, I remember looking at him like, this. did he just tell me he's going to put me back down? And I was like, what? <laughs> I said, I'm going to put you back down to get your helmet. And I, I like, get the time. Yeah, okay. And I remember sitting at the door the other way and saying, I'm not too sure actually just getting out of the whole inspection thing was the right thing to do. <laughs> I, remember, I, remember, I remember that flash through my mind and said, I, I just did all this to stop myself from polishing boots. I don't think that was the right thing to do, actually. So went down, got me helmet. Oh, Ironically, put, put the helmet on. On my head, I never felt like such a need putting it on inside in the water and it's full of water, but I put it back on my head anyway. And I went back up into the aircraft. And of course, at the time, like the, the dealing with stuff like back then was we kind of had a bit of a debrief. But the, the biggest mystery for me was why did this spin happen? Why I, I could kind of get over as in what happened, as in why I rotated so fast, but what were the what were the circumstances that induced the spin? What was the environmental conditions? What was the, the geographical location? And all these questions, I ask these questions now because I understand it far better. Um, but at the time, I, I didn't ask myself those questions because I didn't really understand that I was new to the job. Maybe there was a certain element of, oh, I don't know, we're asking all these kind of rookie questions, like, you know, because lads are going to think of a clown then. And I, and I already nearly lost my helmet, like, so. <laughs> Like, I don't really want to make the situation any worse, like, so, but that was all inside my head. Like, if I had spoken to the lads there, I'm sure they would have explained it, but it, it was, it was my, you know, if you like, decision not to verbalise these questions and not to ask. So I have to say that they may have been, back then, an air or an environment of, don't be asking them kind of questions, that's a stupid question to be asking, but certainly in my head, I had put that scenario there that I can't be asking these kind of stupid questions. But 
as we know, and as we've always encouraged people coming through, there is no thing, such thing as a stupid question. Just ask it. If you have something on your mind, just say it. Just say it. There's no problem. Ah. Don't worry about it. We, we may we might like, laugh at you a little bit, but that's okay. You asked the question. But, and, and you know what? We laugh amongst ourselves. We can guarantee you that. We're not going to stand up in a podium. Do you hear what they just asked? We'll, we'll have a bit of crack amongst ourselves. The most important thing is just say it, regardless what's on your mind, regardless those little fears or whatever the case is. So I mean, Don then, that was always obviously in the back of my mind. I mean, Don then, as I said, qualifying the Dolphin, which was a bigger aircraft. And it was always kind of in the back of my mind there then, but there was always something going on because we weren't strictly just doing search and rescue back then. We were doing VIP, we were doing all other stuff as well within the Air Corps. Then I went on to join... Um, the CHC Ireland uh, and the Irish Coast Guard and then with the much bigger aircraft the S61 it was a fucking beast like you could have just put the alouette into it you know <laughs> yeah. all, you could just put it into it so I said oh man and then I actually remember that the the downwash uh, or a spin was never an issue with the C as big as the aircraft was it was never an issue and I don't know is it because of the length of the blades, the amount of, like, there's five blades on it and stuff like, and the, the dome wash just seemed to be, it was severe, it covered a large area, but it seemed to be a very gentle kind of dome wash in comparison to the 92 that we're working with now. The, the dome wash on the, on the 61 I would describe as just very forgiving. And I never had an issue with it uh, under the 61. Never had an issue with it. So then, fast forward, then we go on to the 92, and now already, even before the aircraft arrived, the lads were talking about um, the dome wash being a problem on the 92. And all of a sudden, it was like I was transported back. Subconsciously, I was now being brought back to, to 1998, where the Alouette was a, a, a massive issue, or where the dome wash was an, was an issue, or the spin was an issue. Yeah. And it was like, and it was constantly recurring. And I do, I remember physically going out the door in the first time with the 92, and I remember saying, we're getting fucking hammered here. Like in the first 12, 15 beach, you know, we're just getting absolutely boxed around the place from the dome wash. Like, and then in certain wind conditions that you, you would remain in the dome wash, you know, because of light winds or whatever. It's just such a powerful aircraft. Like it's an impressive, powerful aircraft. So again, in my head, that's what uh, was now building on, building on and building on. And it, I made a, a very interesting observation myself, uh, and I suppose it just goes to show the, the importance of proper checks and kind of paperwork and all that kind of stuff and maintaining it. So I had an issue with any discipline that would have done in the aircraft uh, where the aircraft was in a hover, because in a hover, I associated that with a spin. And I was more comfortable over the water, as in going in behind the boat or if we were doing wets, because even though I ended up in water, black and out in water, there was always the option that you could move away in any direction from the water. So you could increase that forward speed and off you go because you're doing the wets or recovering somebody from the water mannequin. There's always loads of space around you. So you can move left or right. So you don't do it in a confined area. Whereas a sea cliff, you may only have the one option of escape or as in forward or out to the left or whatever the case is. So in my head, then the, the the cliffs are a gotcha because if I go into a spin, the wind shot may not have necessarily the options to recover me from the spin. Right. And, I go, and it's all building inside in your head and it, and it builds and it builds and it builds. So believe it or not, then, um, so there, and I'm just going very quickly, there was two tragic events obviously that happened in my career. One was in 1998 with the, the lads, the four lads were lost in Tremor. And um, that kind of, that obviously big event put as big an event as I thought was the spin, that just reduced that into insignificance. I know the, the next big event was losing four colleagues. Uh, yeah. So, and it put it into that little box and put it into the back of the head. And I think that's why then I got through the rest of the career with Dolphin 61 and all that. So then, believe it or not, in 2017, uh, in, in March of 2017, uh, and early on in March, maybe the, the first or the second week, I... I would describe it as almost like a like a panic attack, like a, like I just kind of got anxious at the door, and I found I couldn't close the door of the ninety two. No, it did have uh, there was kind of a sticky latch on it or something. It was just difficult to close. The engineer sorted it out, 
But I, I find that it, for me, it was a much bigger deal than what it actually was. And I remember, uh, I'm sure he won't mind mentioning his name, Keith Carlin was the, the winchman, fucking rock solid guy. So Love Keith Carlin. He he's the, been on this podcast and he's told, told some amazing stories. Love the guy. Yeah, rock solid guy. So uh, he was the winchman and uh, he could see I was having difficulties at the door. And he says, uh, will I give it a go? And he kind of says, do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he closed the door. And I remember standing back, kind of down the center of the aircraft it was the it was the older version of the 92 where there's a big augs tank kind of in the middle of it just under the rotor head and i remember standing back there and i was looking down at the floor and i remember having a feeling of just being so lost i remember like i was standing just on the side of the street dressed in normal clothes and you know just trying to make my mind up about something whether i'll cross the road or whether i'll go down the street pop into the shop or get a cup of coffee I remember just actually feeling like that, the, a feeling of lost, a feeling of not actually participating or being part of the crew. That's how I felt myself. So we landed on and we went back um, to the base. Obviously, we debriefed. I remember we were chatting to Keith then the following morning and, and I had said it to him and he said, all right, Jay. And he said, do you want to talk about stuff and the whole lot? Like, and we were just chatting and I said, Joe, Keith, I think there's something... I think there's something just not right. I says, I can't quite necessarily put me, me finger on it, but I says, I just think there's something not right. I said, I don't know what it is. So, and Keith is very, he's very good to chat to, and he made me aware just of all the different bits and pieces that you can do, people you can talk to and all that. And it, it did register with me. I didn't necessarily act on it straight away. And around the same time, uh, maybe two or three weeks beforehand, one of the lads inside in the locker room says, Jez Nick is, uh, you're doing a bit of training. I says, no, um, I was doing a bit of swimming there at the start of the year, all right? But actually, and when I actually started going back through, this is, I didn't verbalize it. I said, ah, actually, no. I thought to myself, actually, no, I'm not doing any training. He says, you're looking great. He says, you lost a pile of weight. And I says, all right, yeah, yeah, cheers. Yeah, yeah. And I thought nothing more of it. Uh, and when he came into work the following day, like my well, belt buckle, and it probably sounds like a cliche, like, but it had gone back two notches. On, on the, I always wear to say, I'm not a fashion god or icon or anything like that. <laughs> I wear the same shit all the time, Jason. But, uh, uh, Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's obviously clean, like, but the, my my jeans, it was like a leather belt pocket. You could see that it had gone back actually two notches. And it was then a register with me saying, when the fuck did that happen, like? Because I, I hadn't noticed it. Other people had made comment on it. Geez, you're looking great. Are you doing a bit of training? Or whatever the case was, because they'd know I'd be doing swimming and stuff. And uh, it never really registered. But it was just that morning, then it registered with me. Bell buckle has actually fucking gone back. Like So I went into the GP. Uh, and she says, well, and she was very, she was very good GP. And uh, she says, what, what is look a great. GP? Oh, sorry, general practitioner, like your doctor. Oh, okay, got it. Doctor. Make sure so, I'm on the same page with you. Absolutely, fair play. And uh, so she said, look, she says, it's very simple. There's two reasons why people lose weight. And she says, it's either physical, she says, you're, you're doing training or whatever the case is, or, or an illness. Or she says, it's psychological. She says, there's, you're under a lot of stress or whatever the case is. So I said, oh. I said, it must be physical. Even then, like, I was kind of not kind of going down the psychological thing. Like, oh, it must be physical. So she did a broad range of bloods and blah, blah, blah. So... All those results came back and they were all fine. There was no issue with that there at all. So then that was kind of the realization. Then so it must be fucking it's like whether I accept it or not, it must be psychological because the doctor said it's either physical or it's psychological. So my logical head kind of kicked in. Then so okay, whether I want to accept it or not, it must be the psychological one. It has to be. So that's when I decided then right, I'm going to get something sorted about this. I st I'm still not too sure how to do it, but I'm, I'm going to do it. No idea what the, what the road is going to, to lead. So uh, after that, then, in the middle of that, uh, 17th of March happened, and we lost four colleagues up off Black Sod. And just that like... Was, um, that was the aircraft... Rescue 116. Yeah, Rescue 116. Right. Um, and just like... And it, it hit me a couple of days after. I was walking the beaches, because um, obviously we were scoping, we used to do searches on the beaches and stuff like that. So... It just hit me then in when I was walking the beaches. I don't know what happened. I don't even know if I was talking. I said, you know what? This is actually a carbon copy of 1998. I have this thing in my head about the spin. Now it's possibly going to be over. It was over by another tragic event. And I thought, you know what? I'm actually not going to allow history to repeat itself. 
and I'm actually going to do something about it. Nice. And I'm going to get it done. And I'm actually going to get it fucking done. And I remember that was my first, I'm going to take action moment. I'm just going to do it. I had no idea what action was at that time, but I remember saying to myself, I'm just going to do it. Whatever the consequences, I'm going to do it. So we were still doing shifts and stuff at the time. And I remember sitting on shift on a coach up in the base. Uh, and we had not long taken over shift. I remember sitting at the coach and I was just thinking, I wasn't emotional. I wasn't sad. I, I wasn't, I don't remember being, you know, particularly emotional or anything like that. I remember turning to the to the windshop alongside me and I said, I literally just said to him, I'm going to pop off home there because I actually, I shouldn't be here at all. That's actually just what I said to him. So we're in the middle wow. of the shift. We're on to world jury. I said, I actually shouldn't be here at all. I said, I'm just going to go on my way home. And he's like, huh? So at first he thought it was probably like a joke or a wind up because we would obviously play pranks and stuff like so. Um, he said, what? He said, yeah, I said, I'm actually just going to go on my home. I said, my head isn't in the right place at all. I said, I'm just going to head off. And he said, uh, okay. Yeah, no problem. I'm sure it probably took a while from to for it to settle in. So I went downstairs. I was getting changed. He followed down. He says, "Is everything okay?" I says, "Everything is actually fine." I remember the, the calmness that I had. I said, "Everything is actually fine." I said, "I just I've come to realization. I said I shouldn't be here," and I said, "I'm going to head home." Uh, and I could kind of tell that maybe he was a little bit concerned or whatever. So he said, "Look, is, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything you want me to do?" And I said, "No." I said, "I'm actually good. I'm actually good." I said, "I'll give you a buzz or whatever when I get home." I can't remember if I did. And I just walked off the base, and I, I just left it all behind me. I just walked off the base. So at the time, then that was after the crash, and the company uh, had obviously contacted the services of counselors and stuff like that with everything that was going on. So there was counselors to and fro and coming from the base. And I remember that took a couple of days for that to set up. And I remember the phone rang and it was one of the managers at, at work. And I remember looking at the screen, his name came up like, and I go, oh, fuck, here we go. Because I just walked off the fucking base. Like I just literally, I'm out there. So man, this is going to be Karen and Choma going to explain this. Like, so answer the phone anyway. And uh, I remember the calmness of his voice. I won't mention his name, but he wouldn't be a, an individual that would you could necessarily say had people skills. And he, he said, he said, how are you? And I said, you know, I said, I'm good. I said, I'll, we've obviously have a system where you have to bring in sick notes. And I said, look, I said, I'll get on top of all the sick notes. I'm not ringing you about that at all. He says, I just, he says, just want to know how you're getting on. He says, how are you? And I said, I'm actually good. I said, I have a bit of a plan in place. I said, I'm going to put it into action there. Like, you know, so I'll be honest with you. I said, I'm sorry for being so vague. I said, I don't know what the plan is. So I said, I'm, I'm asking for a certain element of trust there. But I said, I, I, I do... I said, there is something not right. And I said, I'm going to get it sorted. And I said, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm being very vague about this. But I said, if you just bear with me for a while, I said, I, I can get it sorted. You take all the time you want. He says, there's absolutely no problem at all. He said, I'm just ringing to see how you're getting on. And he says, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, no. I said, I'm, I'm probably getting in touch with the, the company EAP and all that kind of stuff. Right? You know, I said, I, I'm sorry. I said, I probably come across as very scattered. I said, but I, I, I am just going to get stuff done. Like. And he says, yeah, no problem. He says, you have me phone number so he says if you want me to do anything for you if there's nothing I can do for you just give me a buzz I says yeah no problem I remember being blown away by that conversation because as I said he was he was a person that I wouldn't have associated with people's skills but I just thought he was so engaged and he was he was just reaching out from that that murkiness of that carnage that I didn't know what was going to unfold or what was going to happen and it was just yeah. that huge big hand to shake to say don't worry about it everyone's grand and then it just this disappeared back into the work in this thing. And I was blown away by the conversation. So I went over uh, into the counsellors. They, they had come down to the base. I got a phone call to say, listen, there's counsellors uh, down there, because obviously the lads would have heard, you know, and um, do you want to pop down and, and just, you know, if I want to have a chat or whatever, or, geez, uh, I nearly, you know, I nearly jumped down the phone. I'm like, I've been down there in fucking two minutes. I was about two hours away. I was yeah, yeah, I've been down there. <laughs> Tell them not to keep the base. I've been down there. I've been down there. So I drove down the road and uh, went into the concert and had a chat with them. Like, and I think it, it all just poured out as, as the same as we go, like, is that she got both barrels in the face. Like it just, everything, 20 years of stuff just bleh, was just verbal diarrhea out on the table right there. Like, yeah. And uh, I, I remember saying, she saying to me like that, um, 
we're, you know, we're going to stop it there now. We're going to stop it because you're going too far back and, and you're doing too much. And it was literally like I just couldn't stop talking. Like I was just, I was just getting stuff out there. But uh, but there was another time, and I tell you, and then, and it just, and like she eventually, I remember, like she put four hands on the table. She says, "We're going to have to stop you there now." She says, "And how do you feel about coming back to chat some more?" And I thought, like, yeah, like later. And it was just like, yeah. no, like like two or three days time or next week or whatever. I said, yeah, but I said, you, but you'll definitely, you'll be back. Like, well, yeah, I was so desperate to talk to just to get it all out. Like just to, just to leave it out there. And, um, we did set up a, a like a program where you get chatting to counselors and stuff like that. And I remember when, when I walked back, she was in a room across from the hangar. And I remember just walking the, the length of the hangar, the hangar is big enough to take the S92. So it's maybe 30 meters by 30 meters, whatever. And I remember by the time I got to the other side of the hangar, I was so mentally wrecked that, do you know when your eyes get watery when you're tired or you're looking yeah. into the room? By the time I had walked to the other side of the hangar, that's the way I was. Because I had just left it all out on the table. Whether she wanted it or not, I just left it there. And it was just wow. like, oh. And I, I actually went into one of the rooms and just put my head down for a while. I had to, I just couldn't. I, it just... It all got out there. So went on into more counselors, uh, was off the roster maybe for a period of time, and then came back into to work then again and came back to work as a dual rated winch man, winch operator. Uh I can't remember the timeline or what year that was. And then I remained on the, the roster then, no problem, no issues at all. And then I think, believe it or not. It was around the time of the LA of, and we had done one or two other jobs as well, where we had recovered or taken six people from the bottom of the cliff uh, and recovered them just back onto a field. We didn't even recover them back into the aircraft. We just recovered them back onto a field. Nice. Okay. And I remember when, I, yeah, and I remember when I was going to that job, um, knowing that the, the people were at the end of a cliff, um, I, I as a wind shop was kind of getting anxious about it because I was saying, oh, wow, what happens if I was winch man today? After the flight, so we did the flight and it was perfect. But what what that registered with me is that, do you know what I You haven't actually one hundred percent fixed yourself because you know if you're starting to get anxious as a winch up, thinking that oh what would happen if I came in as a winchman today, things still aren't right with you. You need yeah. to sort your you need to sort your shit out. And I remember having that very frank conversation with myself, regardless of what the lads thought at work, what I thought that they would think at work, the lads. And I know they'll they'll know I say this in the best possible way. Didn't give it a shot. They just wanted to make sure that you were okay. Do you know what I'm saying? They didn't yeah. care if you came on and off the roster five times or for whatever reason, just as long as you're okay. And fair play to them, they you know they backfield shifts and the whole lot. Like so the lads were amazing, every work was amazing. And uh, but I, I do remember having that conversation. And then not long after that, then I took myself off the roster again. And I said, right, I'm going I'm gonna to have to gonna to have to go back here now and get this sorted. So it was back in with more counselors, uh, and then ended up being assessed um, through our AME, which is our aviation medical examiner, and they would look for specific reports either from a psychologist or whatever the case is. And I remember being quite anxious about that because I remember thinking, well, I don't know what what are they going to say, and what happens if if they find me unfit to return to work or or that I can't or because of whatever issues and all oh, this is building. How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to do this? How am I going to explain to the family? How am I going to speak to friends? Like, you know, oh, you have a great job and tell us about this. And, that. and like, oh, that's going to stop. And it's, and it's all building. And it's all running around inside my head. Million, million miles an hour. And it's going to... And then I remember um, I was constantly asking, what if, what, 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 what? And then one day, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I kind of had a, I'm calling it like an epiphany. And I changed the question from what to why. Why did you seek more professional help? Why Why did you yourself do that? Why did you make that brave step to step forward and ask the question, why am I doing this? And then I answered that question. I said, it's because I needed it. it it's yeah. because that that's why I did it. It's because I needed it. And then it was the realization, well, then it doesn't matter what the consequences are. Because if you don't get it fixed, the consequences could be massive. But if you do get it fixed, still have a head in your shoulders, you know, can still go out and find employment. 
It may not necessarily be anything to do with the emergency service, but you know what? Who cares? Does it does it really matter that we walk around with a with any kind of uh, virtual label on our back to say I'm a member of the emergency services? It's like it's about me as an individual now. I know I have to do what's best for myself, and it's kind of like two fingers to the consequences because I have to get myself fixed first, and now I can look after everything else. And I remember going in into to meet with various people after that, uh, both councillors and for the assessment, particularly the councillors, they would have said, oh, we can see a big change in you, do you know how are you feeling? And I said, I've come to the realisation that it actually doesn't matter if I return to the fucking helicopter or not, like. And that's it, because the, <laughs> the most important thing is to get myself fixed. Yeah. And it's, absolutely. How would you like to do that? And, and that's what I found then, is that an awful lot of the, the things that you do are in your court. During your, it's how you want to fix yourself. It's not necessarily that you go and take medication or, or whatever the case is, but it's you handle it at your own pace. And I would say that that mental health is ninety five percent self help because you have to make that initial decision call to say, I actually need it or I think I need it, and I'm going to make the call. And I would say that that. I had said it obviously in, in previous uh, earlier on to you, but I would say that that was the biggest call I made in my career was to say, I fucking need a little bit of help here and I'm going to get it. And nice. I would say that I would say that was the biggest call I made in my career ever, ever. And that was a really game changer for me. I'm sure if you're chatting to the lads down below at work or whatever, that they would probably see that they would, that they would probably say that they would probably see a change in we would hope for the better or whatever the case is like you know but certainly i would like to think that yeah i have i have changed for better but now here i am um back at work uh, and as a winch operator and just very quickly because i won't dwell on it if people i think in our line of work people feel that there's a huge air of responsibility on us and that we have to be seen as being perfect that we're impervious to stuff that we're not undaunted or dented by anything either the anything that we see or anything that we hear or and in general, we can always come up with reasonable and responsible decisions and that make sense and that are logical. But you know what? The, the truth of it is, is that we're, we're, susceptible, we're susceptible to all those things. We can be dented. We can be damaged. Uh, we can be kicked around the place mentally. And yeah. Oh, yeah. But, and the most important thing is, when you take your break from work, you can return to work better than what you were before you took the break. And if you want proof of that, when I took myself off the roster first and identified a problem, it was after that that I did the job with the LA off. It was not oh, before. Wow. It was after my break. That's when I did the job with LA off. After my break, not before it. So if anybody wants to take anything from it, yeah, you can say to yourself, I need a break. And yeah, you can to work, return to work as good, if not better. So don't worry about it. Right. You take your break and look after yourself. You know, I, I, I can, I can totally empathize with you. I was, I've been there myself, and it's to have the support system around you is, is such a key element to everything that we do as rescue men, um, rescuers in general, I should say. But yeah, we thank you for that. Yeah. For sure. Water. And, and I hope I haven't uh, tipped on a nerve. I, I, I can see just maybe maybe I have or something, but like nope. I, I think it, I think it's just so important that everybody just just talks about it because it's not, you know, it's not it's not an alien concept. It's just us. And like, you know, let's let's talk. So I'd like I actually like to say to you, fair play to you, and I have huge admiration for you and respect for you for doing what you're doing, for allowing oh, people to come up. Yeah, for, for absolutely, for allowing people to come on and to talk about things. And, and let's normalize stuff. Let's hear all the interesting and maybe funny stories or maybe kind of tragic or whatever case is. But let's let's normalize all the other stuff as well, you know, because because yeah. we owe it to ourselves. We absolutely owe it to ourselves to do it, you know. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. Because there's so much we go out and do. And like you said, it's, you know, we, we do get hurt. We do, do get damaged. And you mm -hmm. need that support system. You need that that person to to open up to and and all of us uh the, the biggest problem with us is we're type a and we're like nothing is gonna bother us i'm a tough guy i can move on i don't i don't need to talk about this 
yeah, yeah. maybe you don't right at this second, but it's you know what? Yeah. Ask the question. You said it in the beginning. Don't don't be that guy. Ask the question. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're a new guy. If it's a stupid question, which there is no such thing as a stupid question, but if it was a stupid question, <laughs> we might have a little laugh, but we will give you the answer. We will yeah. help you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because we've all we've all been in that situation. We've all asked the the, the stupid questions. It's just the questions that we don't know. Because so so let's let's lean on the people that have the experience that went before us. Yeah. And let's ask them the questions and let us not go through either the bad experience that they had. Because at the end of the day, uh, yourself, myself, everybody that works will say in any kind of role in the emergency services, we're we're people that stand on the shoulders of giants. And the giants are the people that have gone before us. Yeah. And that's fine. So isn't this remiss or isn't it wrong of us then not to learn from them? Because like otherwise it's just history repeating itself, isn't it? If somebody 20 years ago makes a mistake, isn't it, isn't it a poor showing on me if I now make that exact same mistake 20 years later just because I didn't open my gob and say, could you tell us about that? Because yeah. like, you know, you know, so let's let's learn from it and let's let's evolve from it also. So I yeah. So. so I suppose if, if I was to leave you writing, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I love it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Man, That's it. Uh, but I'm not saying for a second I was going to leave you there, but yeah, but yeah, we we do like we do. We stand up on the experiences of people who have gone before us, you know. Yeah. And it's it's a That's good thing to have, you know, to get all that advice from the the people that were before us. I mean, yeah. I still talk to guys that, that have been retired out of the game and have conversations with them. Hey, what did you do? And then when you start hearing stories, you're like, holy cow, that's uh, that makes so much sense. And and why didn't I think of that? Oh, you did think about it 20 years ago. What's the matter with you? Uh, <laughs> you yeah, didn't absolutely. ask the question. Absolutely. And like, there's, there's an absolute, there's a legend of a man that would be here in Ireland. He's, he's known outside of Ireland as well. His name is John Manning. I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name, but the man's a legend. He's been doing search and rescue. So at the time I was training up in Dublin, that would have been back in 2001 or something like that. Uh, and he trained me up as, as a wind chop. I would call him my mentor. I don't think he would return the favor and say I was Nick's mentor. <laughs> but I, I, I certainly I certainly seen him. That's the way I looked at John. And man, I used just, it's such a wealth of information. So back in, in 2001, I think John Manning was doing search and rescue out of helicopters for as long as I was walking the face of the earth. And that was back <laughs> in 2001. He only retired like about four or five years ago. So the experience that, that man has, so like any time I used to being on shift with John, because it was literally how much data can I download out of John? What, what can yeah. John tell me this shift? That's just going to make a difference to me, and like that was that I just love. I just absolutely loved the man just because of the experience that he has, the way he passed on his experience. He's just man is legendary. That's all I can say. And so, love but it. like that, yeah. Those who have gone before us try try and get as much information as we can out of them. You know, definitely. Yep. Definitely. Agreed. But, and and you're here. You are in 2022 doing exactly that because you're allowing <laughs> people to to get that information out of them. And you know it's it's there forevermore. Now the people can look it up on, on the podcast and yeah. listen to what and say, there you go, man. That's brilliant. So thank you for that, Jason. It's phenomenal. Oh man, thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing all your stories. The the knowledge drop just happened. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's absolutely brilliant. It's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Love it. Nick, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and just sharing everything that you just shared with us. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. I really am looking forward to the day I get to Ireland and hang out with all you guys. It's going to be... I don't know if I'm ever actually going to leave the country. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> oh, if I may, be, may make a suggestion, just maybe pack a second liver. That would be great. Uh, cut, roger that. <laughs> Be fantastic. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, if you do get over, uh, if we get a chance to chat again, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely amazing. Uh, and look forward to having you over. And you'll, we look after you. Don't worry about that. Love it. Thanks, brother. Well, I will call you soon, I promise. Cheers. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. <laughs> Go. 
Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember, when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>